Today's guest is a regression therapist from the UK. She deals with all sorts of fascinating regression topics such as past lives, lives between lives, and even future lives. All topics that I'm really intrigued by. So let's give a big coit welcome to Lorraine Flaherty. Coit Cast! Hello Lorraine, welcome to Coitcast. Thank you very much, very happy to be here. Excellent stuff. So I suppose the old classic is, can you tell us about your life journey, i.e. what led you to become a regression therapist? What's your origin story? Okay, so I have to go quite far back. Uh, yeah, sure. Which is back to almost the, the point of kind of coming to conscious awareness and being that really irritating child that wanted to know why about everything. Only my whys tended to be a bit deeper than the average. And I was always kind of questioning why we were here and what we were supposed to be doing. And I couldn't understand why people behaved in certain ways towards each other. It, it baffled me as a child that mm -hmm. sometimes people weren't always pleasant and reading about history and hearing about how people had been really quite disgusting to each other <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at, gotcha. at various points through history. And I was also born into an Irish Catholic family. So obviously religion played a big part. And up to a certain point, I was quite happy to go along with it until things didn't make sense to me. And a lot of the stuff that they were telling me didn't resonate. It, it didn't kind of make sense that we had a benevolent God who loved all people and all children. And yet, if you misbehave or break the rules and don't do what the church tells you, which is supposedly his word, that you're going to be punished and you're going to hell and you're going to be burning in brimstone and you know torture mm. forever. It didn't make sense. So from a very early age, I kind of questioned the church and I questioned t the teachers and the priests. And what was brilliant about it was that I then, as somebody with a really inquiring mind, went on my own research studies. So partly just to annoy all of the priests and the teachers, I started studying other religions at a really yeah. young age. Yeah. And I, not only the other religions, but going right back to their origin, to the earliest points, and even to the origins of Christianity, the early Gnostics and the Essenes. And of course, I found that there were similar threads in all of the religions. And especially if you looked at the esoteric side, the slightly more mystical sides of the religions, like the Sufis and the Gnostics and the Kabbalists, mm -hmm. that the common thread was that we were all essentially one, that we were all connected to a, a higher power, whatever name you wanted to give that, and that the answers to everything that we were looking for, all the knowledge about who we were and you know about our existence, actually resided within us. It wasn't outside. And essentially, the, the deeper meaning behind all religions really was love, that that was the thing that bound us all together and connected us. So they talked about mystery schools and they talked about kind of meditation as a, a tool that you could use to access that. So from about the age of 13, 12, 13, 14, I kind of went on this mad search, which led me to the nickname Weirdo, which... That's nice. I, <laughs> but I quite thrived on it. I think everybody thought it was an insult and I loved it. Um, I also got quite into anything that was uh, kind of a cult. So I was also looking down the roots of magic in its various different forms and looking at, you know, what was beyond on the earth plane. So looking at the, you know, ETs and, and extraterrestrials. And, you know, I always had a really deep affinity for Orion. <laughs> and a, a real kind of knowing that I had this, I didn't know what it was, but I knew I had a connection to Orion. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there were all these different factors. So life kind of, you know, takes you in various different directions. So uh, that search just carried on and I, I started doing meditation classes and I started doing psychic development and I was, I, I trained at the College of Psychic Studies as a medium and uh you know again again kind of questioning is this stuff real I mean, any way to find yeah, out yeah, yeah. do it yourself you know i'm not going to believe somebody else when they tell me something of course i discover that it all is real uh not that everybody is real but it is possible um but i ended up as a hair and makeup artist as my career 
which again, I was always very creative. So, you know, there'd been lots of different options. And I ended up effectively, obviously, you know, if you have a hairdresser, you'll know that uh, you end up being more of a counsellor really than anything else. Eventually, the <laughs> hairdressing side of it's not really uh, the, the main component. It's the listening and it's the being a, a kind of a person that's separate from that person's world and they can share and, and you know, tell you their life story and I realised that I liked that bit and I liked being able to get people to see things in different ways or from different perspectives. So n- not ever telling anybody what to do, but opening their eyes to different things. And of course, I was studying self-development and you know, really exploring all the different fields of psychology and therapy. And you know, when you're a hairdresser, you don't really, I was so caught up in it and the makeup world it was all very external, you know, changing what people look like on the outside. But I think deep down, I knew that somewhere down the line, I wasn't going to be able to do that forever. And I think I always kind of knew that I'd end up doing some kind of therapy, but I didn't know what. And and I guess there's a sort of, not necessarily an insecurity, but, you know, when you're a hairdresser, you're always kind of labelled as somebody that might be a bit thick. That's why you went into... <laughs> hairdressing you know sorry it is, it is a bit of a stereotype and uh you know I, I actually nearly didn't get my job because I had too many qualifications I had too many owner things so the guy actually said to me you sure you want this job yeah <laughs> so I, not only was I searching and exploring but I actually underwent five years of psychosynthesis myself because I knew that if one day I was going to be a therapist I'd have to you know, I would, I'd have to have cleared my own stuff first. And I couldn't find the thing. I trained in Reiki. I trained in all kinds of different healing modalities. And nothing actually seemed right. Even the psychosynthesis, I, I thought that might be the thing. But I looked back on my five years and I realized that in all the talking therapy that I did, which was once a week for five years, that there had been a handful of sessions that had actually made a difference, a real difference. Not that I'm saying talking therapy isn't useful. You know, you saying to them or to you or to both? To me. To me. So, uh, you know, talking therapy, if you're in a bind or if you're in a difficult place in your life, is really useful to help you to bring stuff to the surface and process it. But I don't think it actually resolves necessarily resolves problems. And I'm a why person anyway. I need to know why something has happened. But the sessions that made a difference for me were the ones where I closed my eyes and I went inside and I accessed my intuition, my inner knowledge, which kind of you know, connected with what I'd learned, you know, in those early years when I was doing that study. And so I was kind of being led to, which I hadn't even realised, to hypnosis. So I read a few books on it, I'll be honest, uh, reading through it and reading what a session does and how it happens actually bored me a little bit it seemed a bit slow and a bit dull I'm quite a dynamic person and so it put me off a little bit and I thought oh maybe I'll do that later I, yeah. it, it resonated but it was something I was going to leave until I was kind of you know a much older person and just wanted to sit down all day and then I got frustrated and uh, and I don't know if you've ever had this but you know at a certain point I just And I had enough of searching and being lost and not knowing what I was doing. And I just said to the universe, for God's sake, can you just give me a helping hand here? Because I'm stuck and I'm lost and someone or something needs to help me. And then for about six weeks after that, every person I spoke to or every magazine article I read or, you know, wherever I was, NLP came up, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which I didn't really know much about. So I researched it. I found out that Paul McKenna, who was, oh, yes, yeah. who was uh, you know, quite a famous hip stage hypnotist at the time, uh, was running these courses <clears throat> with the guy that in- had invented NLP. So I just signed up. I didn't really know too much about it. It was a seven-day training. And on the second day of the training, uh, we ended up doing hypnosis. And it was like somebody had opened the gates of heaven and I had you know the hallelujah (laughs) moment it wasn't boring that time then no absolutely not it was absolutely miraculous because by putting somebody into the trance state and asking them the right questions she went straight to the source of her problem 
she went straight to a memory that showed her why she had a fear of, I can't remember if it was dogs or spiders or something. And the, the awareness of it, and we were able to kind of transform the memory in her mind. And I thought, oh my God, this is the thing I've been looking for. You know, meditation is fantastic, but it's quite passive. I meditate, I get insights, I sometimes get answers, but I can't really, I can't really change anything. Whereas hypnosis became this active process where you could use the state itself to go in and communicate with the subconscious and really dig around and look for information. So I left there and then went straight into a two and a half year advanced hypnosis training course. Uh, carried on training with the NLP as well. I became a, an assistant on their training courses for about seven, eight years. And when I finished my hypnosis training, I became a lecturer for the college. And my guilty pleasure was the past life work because that was kind of my passion, the esoteric side. But I did a very clinical hypnosis training and they didn't really support it. They taught it because it was a component in the course. Mm. But even my teacher said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm teaching it, but I don't really believe in it. I don't really believe in past lives. That's weird for a teacher to do that, isn't it? Because they're not supposed to give an opinion on it. No, exactly. And, you know, the worst bit was that this guy was my supervisor and I'd chosen him because he was my favourite teacher because he was very pragmatic. He was, you know, he just got on with it and he was, mm. he was very, very uh, knowledgeable about what he did. And, of course, he went on in the class to do the most extraordinary demo we had seen in a year. And... The outcome of that demo was that the person he did it on was completely transformed. This was a guy who'd been incredibly shy, who never spoke up. He was always on the sidelines, very timid. And he went into a past life as a young woman, which kind of threw him, especially when he's doing this in front of a, you know, 60 people in a class. And he was, it was kind of Victorian times. And this young lady had been born into a very wealthy family but felt as though she wasn't doing enough. She felt like this life of privilege and, you know, having everything wasn't satisfying. So she ran away to become a nurse in like Africa or somewhere. She, she you know, kind of escaped the family and boarded a ship and was on this mission to make something of herself and the world. And tragedy struck and the ship sank. And this guy is at the front of the class describing the walnut wood of the cabin that he's in mm. and the trunks and the, you know, the, the books and all of the study material that the woman had taken with her to, to, to prep for the, for the role. And, of course, the, the ship sinks and she dies and dies feeling like a complete failure because she still hadn't achieved anything. She hadn't made a mark she hadn't done anything to help anybody in the world so there's this really powerful feeling of being a failure and what happens in past life work when it's done as a, a therapy is that when you get to the death point you kind of ascend from the death point to allow people to have a, a, a kind of higher perspective to get a clearer view to find out what was really going on and actually he found out that the lesson had been are you brave enough to make a stand are you brave enough to actually go for your dreams which she had been like she might not have succeeded but actually the test the soul test was would you go for it no yeah. even against everything you know she's a woman in victorian times so there was this sudden realization oh my god i was brave enough oh actually i did fulfill what i was supposed to it was just the intention and the the, the going like doesn't doesn't really matter that i didn't do anything and suddenly it flipped this sense of failure to this absolute sense of success and confidence. And the guy got a message from his higher self to say, look, she didn't make it. She didn't actually get to help anybody. But now you're here. You have another chance. You're training to be a therapist, which is a role in which you can help lots of people. So go for it. You know, stand up for yourself. Make a difference. And honest to God, when the guy opened his eyes, his entire demeanor changed. He was suddenly, he, he sat upright, he was making eye contact. And for the rest of that course, he was like a different person. And so I remember thinking, okay, <laughs> there, is, there is definitely more to this. 
So when I started my practice, which started very clinical, uh, I started working in a, a crystal shop and uh, a, a place where tarot readers would work. Okay. And, and, yeah, yeah. Healers. and I thought, oh, well, I'll just do my past life stuff there. You know, it, I won't let it interfere with my proper my proper work. And of course, as I started to work through it, the transformations and the healing that happened with the past life stuff was leaps and bounds ahead of anything that I was doing with the just usual clinical protocols. And eventually over time, without me doing anything, without me advertising or, or really promoting, suddenly the clients that were coming to me in the clinical arena were starting to ask for past lives. Okay, so that's a, a long journey, but I like it. And what I'm really interested in is one point you said in there, which is, I wonder if this has happened to you. Um, I think it, you mentioned something about like when you needed to ask for help of the universe to change your position. Yeah. And that's happened to me in one of my previous jobs where I just okay. had enough of retail, right? Because I was right. working in Comet at that stage and it just really annoyed me. And I was like, all right, I've had enough. And then the very next day or that evening, I called out for help and I asked for friends on Facebook and a mate got me into another job, which right. started me on my journey now to the creativity. So right, you can do this. You can break out of it. And I like that. Yeah. And absolutely. the second part is uh, it's going to be a question, which is okay. once you got to the hypnosis and the regression and, and, and attended that course, did it feel right at that point? Oh, I tell you, I mean, when I came back, when I finished that seven day NLP course, I think my parents thought I'd lost the plot because it felt so right that I was, I couldn't, I was kind of bouncing around. I couldn't actually walk. I almost, I was just, I was so totally and completely in alignment. It felt like everything had dropped into place. I mean, it was the most certainty I've ever known before or since. It was just... Mm pure pure clarity that that was the, the the path that i was supposed to follow and yeah in fact i mean it was so much so that i the next two to three years really i completely focused on it i didn't go out i didn't have a social life i literally was kind of almost locked in my apartment just studying and reading and practicing and fine-tuning and kind of honing the craft, reading everything that I could about it, uh, researching everything I could about it. And yeah, I just knew it was my mission. Absolutely. It's weird, isn't it? I think that's probably the best way of describing it, like a knowing. Yeah. Rather than a feeling per se, because I think they're slightly separate. Well, they, that's yeah. what it appears to be to me anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> interestingly, I'm not usually a very decisive person because I... <laughs> I'd say I have butterfly mind, but I have lots of interests and lots of things that I'm passionate about. So there could be lots of different paths that I could take and lots of different projects that I could work on. And, and I'm always thinking, oh, is it this one? Is it this one? Do I do, go here? Do I go there? But this was the first time in my life that that knowing was complete. There was no question that that was the right thing. It's interesting that it's interesting. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but then maybe we'll, we'll cover that at the, during the rest of the conversation. OK, so let's talk about the process itself. So regression, hypnosis, yeah. regression from your perspective. What is it if you can describe it as a process or. OK, so as someone that works with hypnosis, which is often sort of maligned and gets a lot of bad press because of stage hypnosis and thing you know every time you see a movie with hypnosis in it it makes me cringe because the villain is always the hypno hypnotist <laughs> and you know this idea that we can control people and make them do things they don't want to do to be honest it's all actually nonsense you know even a stage hypnotist isn't controlling anybody nobody on that stage is doing anything that they don't want to do and if they're ever asked to do things they don't feel comfortable about they just open their eyes and they stop you know it, it's often more about somebody being an exhibitionist and wanting to be the star of the show than anything to do with the hypnosis. Okay. Uh, it can amplify their ability to do things because here's the thing that people don't realize all hypnosis is, is a focused state of attention, you know, and whenever we're daydreaming, whenever we're lost in thought, whenever we are really focused on a particular task, you know, sometimes people will call it being in the zone or being in the flow. 
where you're not thinking about anything else. You lose all track of time because you're so singularly focused on that one thing. And really, that's all hypnosis is. And sometimes it's an amplified version of that. But but what that heightened state does is it gives us access to the subconscious part of the mind, which is the storage facility. So the subconscious, I always say, you know, Paul McKenna always talked about the mind as being like a computer. It's like a hard drive with loads of access, loads of data files on there, which we can access only when we're in that trance state. So my job when I'm working with my clients is to be the guide. So I know how to navigate. I'm like a GPS, really. So <laughs> they're driving, they're, they're in control, but I'm doing the navigation to get them into their subconscious. And then I know what questions to ask. And I'm always tuning in with the, if we could call it the unconscious part of the mind, we could call it, I call it higher mind sometimes because it's the intuitive it is that kind of knowing part, you know, that the bit of me that knew that the hypnosis was the right thing was my intuition. It, you know, it was that higher part of my brain that's connected to some higher purpose, some higher aspect of us. So my job as the therapist is to ask the higher mind of the client to find the most relevant, the most significant of their other lifetimes. And we'll come back to the word other in a minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, that uh, will help them to understand the challenge that they're facing in their current life. Because they've probably had many, many lifetimes. So we only need to find one that is going to be the most significant and then things will start to make sense. And then effectively, I mean, again, we're working in the subconscious realm where memory, imagination, you know, the two things are, are very closely aligned. So it's easier to visualize anyway. But we're actually asking them to step back into a memory. So in the same way that we can recall important events that happen to us in this life, it's almost the same thing, except that they're accessing files that you know are kind of stored slightly differently to our current life files. But again, we use the metaphor of opening the door or going through a column of light or whatever symbology works for them, and then they step into the experience. And then my job as the guide is to again, being very inquisitive is where it comes in really useful, is to ask as many questions as I can. And for some of the clients, the story will unfold like a movie. So they may go in and they're a child and, and they'll ex explain something that's going on or a particular scene. And then they may go, oh, and now I've grown up and now I'm 10 or, you know, now I'm 15. And the story can sometimes unfold very much like that. Sometimes it's just snapshots, very fleeting snapshots of an event. And sometimes people don't see anything. It's more of a knowing. Like I'll ask a question and a thought will come into their mind. It doesn't really matter how it plays out. But as I said earlier, the most important bit is that we get them to the end of the life, to the death point, because I want to see what was unfinished. What emotions were they holding at, at that point of death? What beliefs about themselves, if they think that they failed or if they think that they are you know, worthless or they, they think that they're a bad person? Because all of that is kind of tangible. All of that becomes un unfinished business that they carry with them, which effectively I see it, they kind of park it in, you know, their soul's warehouse. And then when they decide to reincarnate, they have to go back to the warehouse and go, right, what have I still got to work on? What, what's undone? And they choose one of the lessons. And then they have to pick a time frame, a family, a persona, a body type, all of those things that will be the optimal situation for them to work through that lesson. Whoa, there's a lot there, isn't there? Yeah. So when I do the healing work, we go through all of that. I look at what did you sign up for? What did you agree to be tested on? And if they've completed it, then my job is to help them to sign off those contracts. And if they haven't completed it, I will help them to do whatever they need. There may be an insight or an understanding or they might need to do some. So I, I did a session yesterday and one of the clients had, you know, one of the tests was about forgiveness. Okay. Which presupposes okay. that somebody has to do something to you that you need to forgive them for. Otherwise you don't learn. And so one of the characters in the past life had essentially tortured and brutally murdered them. And we had to go back in and look at the reasons why that happened. And this person was terrified and it was connected to, you know, the king had 
you know, ordered this and they honestly believed they were doing the right thing. They thought this person was evil. And so my client, in that understanding that the only reason why that person hurt them was because of their own fear and because they had been lied to and because, you know, their vision of who this person was had been distorted, they were able to forgive them. They were able to say, actually, do you know what? I get it. You know, I see your fear. You thought your family were in danger. You thought everybody was in danger. And so they were just kind of collateral damage. And of course, in that moment of forgiveness, the lesson is done. And it means that, you know, whoever it was, whatever soul had volunteered to to do the harm was then also released from running that contract. Because the problem is, if it isn't finished, often the same souls come back time and time again to continue working through the process. Yeah. And then they get to rewrite the contract to upgrade it to something healthier, something that's going to be more productive. And so she was given permission to experience loyalty and trust and uh, healthy relationships. Right. There's a lot there that I want to get into. Um, and obviously, you've mentioned contracts. So yeah. we're, we're talking soul contracts here. So yeah. uh, well, let's park that one aside for a second. I'll write that down because I want to get okay. to that. Um, let's t- go back to the... Um, metaphor or imagery you gave which is the files scenario and i like that because that's easily seeable isn't it like yeah. so let's just say this life now uh coit paul whatever you want to call me i'm this section yeah a previous section of the memory bank could be dave bob or whatever his name is then steve joeline yeah. or whomever and then there's people after me in a yes. line in theory yeah that's where we'll come back to the other other stuff yeah so i will come back to the other this guy here and if i've got an issue in this life yeah i can go back here yeah to address something there that affects me here that's essentially what you're saying yes because when the healing work is done and this is where the other part comes in uh you know my original training you know the idea in reincarnation is that it's linear that you re you incarnate And then when that lifetime ends, there's a period of time where you wait and then you're reborn. So that these lives are linear. So they're definitely within our timeline, do you think? Or? They're actually not linear at all. So That's what I was going to get at, yeah. Yeah, so calling them past lives is a misnomer because they're not actually past. It's It's only past if we're looking at it from a linear earth plane time perspective. As soon as you step into the subconscious realm, as soon as you step into, you know, and Jung talked about the collective unconscious, which was the library, if you like, where all the hard drives, where all the mm-hmm. all the memories are stored. And they are all happening at the same time. Time doesn't exist in the same way in that outer realm or inner realm. So the, all of the lives that our soul has chosen to experience are all concurrent. So when I'm asking the question about going into a lifetime, it's the most significant or whichever lifetime is the most relevant um, because, yeah, they're, they're all linked. They're all connected. Uh, if I, I'll give you an analogy because it's quite it's in a way easier to see it. So let, let's imagine we've got the ocean, which is, you know, source, God, whatever you want to call it, the universe universal energy, whatever we're a part of. And a part of that energy decides that it wants to have experience and to be challenged, to evolve, to grow for whatever reason. So I see that's like a drop of that vast ocean that will separate. And then that, you know, and we could call that bit, you know, in in, in some spheres, they call that the oversoul because that's the sort of pure energy. And then that pure energy will decide how big of a challenge it wants to go for? What lesson does it want to work on? Is it going to work on love? Is it going to work on forgiveness? Is it going to work on suffering? Is it going to work on, you know, whatever the the lesson might be? And like spokes of a wheel, we imagine the wheel of a wagon, that energy then splits into various components and various different bodies and various different timeframes. So on the wheel, that soul energy, which has chosen to split, all of those lives are now happening at the same time. And they're all connected. And the endings, if you like, of those lifetimes are, it's all malleable. It's all, it's all changeable, depending on what's happening. And anytime healing happens in one of the lives, 
that healing has a ripple effect and it goes right the way around the entire circle because it's all connected. It's all part of the same soul. Any time on that circle that one of the kind of aspects, one of the parts of the soul energy creates karma, good or bad, that affects the whole. And so not only are we having to work with those karma within each individual lifetime, but we're accruing karma with other souls as well, mm. which also needs to be healed and resolved. So it's quite complex when you look at it as a, a, a kind of you know, a, a big picture, because we have to heal and resolve the karma with each of the souls that were interacting with us in those lifetimes. The good news is that the key players are often the same ones. So when we clear the karma, um, from one lifetime's experience it then becomes clear and i've seen this where you know i've had clients so and again i you know I'll do a little plug later you know i wrote a book because i was so blown away by the things that were coming up because i had so many clients where you know you work on that one person and my sessions are quite long they can be three hours sometimes four hours occasionally five hours because i don't like to leave any stone unturned so i really want to get in and clear as much of the karma with these different souls as possible because it's you know effectively we're all connected so you know the more we heal the more opportunities for everybody but clients were coming back to me and saying okay this is really random because i healed this thing with the soul that was my father in that other lifetime and he'd come back he was playing my father again in this life and we were running through a similar problem you know, he was testing me, he was challenging me. And I mean, there was one client, she, interesting, they had a trucking business and the father had retired. She'd taken over the trucking business and, you know, fair play to this girl. She started as a, a truck driver and worked her way up. You know, she wasn't somebody that just came in and was swallowing her. So she knew the business inside out. But even though he'd retired, he couldn't let go. And he was still, he was taking a large chunk of money out of the business and it was making it really difficult for them to survive. And they'd had such a row over it that they hadn't spoken for about four or five years. And so, you know, she hardly spoke to her mother. She didn't really visit anymore. In the past life session, we healed the deal with her father in another lifetime. There was okay. another, it was a test around power, who would have the power. And then they realized that they didn't have to test each other. They could both stand in their own power. And actually the new contract was let's support each other in future opportunities, in, in future experiences. We'll, we'll be there for each other. We'll, you know, two, pa two powers coming together is actually much better than us being separate and trying to fight. And about three days after we did the session, she got a phone call from her mother inviting her around for lunch on Sunday. And she said, but how can I come round? Father's going to be there. And she said, it was your father that told me to invite you. And she got round to the house and he said, I literally, he said, I, I had the worst dream last night. He said, and I've woken up this morning realising I've been a complete idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. Why am I not helping you? It's extraordinary that as my daughter, you've taken the helm and taken on this business. And why am I fighting with you? So I'm going to reduce the amount of money I'm taking out of the business and I'm going to come in and I'm going to support you and help you and, and you know, make sure that you're safe in whatever you're doing. Let, let's do it together. I'll be a silent partner, but I'm here to support you with any help that you need. And she rang me on the Monday and just said, how is this possible? And I said, I don't know. I don't know, but it could, and it could be a coincidence, but you and I both know that it isn't. So she healed it in the ethers and it translated into the current life. And I, and I see this time and time again. Um, hopefully we'll have loads more examples of that because I like the, the way sure. that the, the stories then add up to the picture, which is where you're coming from now. Yeah. now. A couple of questions I have. Obviously, you've mentioned the wheel, which is interesting. And I've not heard of the spokes of a wheel scenario before. Okay. So I like it. I like it as a metaphor and it works. A question you probably can't answer, but I, I need to ask it, which I'll is, you, you know the question probably, how many spokes? It's different for every single soul, and it depends on how brave a soul is. Some souls want to come in and just do the periphery and, you know, just come in and have a, a, a gentle ride. And so they don't really push themselves too far. And if the lessons are easy, it's quite easy to fulfill them. And once you've fulfilled it, you kind of, you know, you're, you're able to kind of move off the, the, the scale. So 
doesn't require a lot. When the lessons are a bit more challenging, if the soul doesn't complete it, the soul energy has to split and come into another form in order to run through the lesson again. So it's kind of infinite. Uh, and those of us that have chosen big challenges will come back time and time again until we get it right. Now, the other thing on that as well is that, you know, I mentioned earlier about what the soul mission might be, what the test is. And what I know is that, let's say a client that's chosen to do forgiveness. So karma, which has often been interpreted as punishment and reward. If I'm bad yeah, here, yeah. I get punished. In, in my perception now, it's not that at all. It's about balance because there isn't any judgment in the spirit realms. Nobody in the spirit realms is assigning a judgment of good or bad to any of the lives that we live or any of the experiences that we have. It's only us that do that. It's all just experience. But what I do know is that it's like a pendulum that swings because if we've chosen to work on forgiveness, it means that firstly, we have to have experiences where we have to forgive people for things that they've done to us. But the pendulum swings equal and opposite all the way back to us doing things to others that we then need to be forgiven for. So it's a it's a complete swing. You know, I had a client recently who, you know, and again, she'd been through some horrors in her current life. Her past life that she went into was equally horrendous. And when we looked at what the lesson was, she had chosen, because she wanted to do unbelievable joy, she had chosen to do unbelievable suffering. But she couldn't do one without the other. Yeah, like you can't experience the highs without the lows. That's exactly. All. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So again, that presupposes that for every choice that we make, there's going to be at least two lives connected to that one lesson, one side being you know, on the, for want of a better term, victim on one side being the perpetrator. Yes, yeah. They often say that, don't they? One being a murderer, one being the victim. It's exactly. So you can experience all angles of it. Um, I, the thought that keeps coming to my mind, and it's been this from other conversations I've had re recently, that the what, what you're describing here is essentially what we would call a computer game. I want to go in on hard, medium, easy level. Yeah. I want to go down a path and I'm not doing this for any real reason other than experience, because that's what a computer game is. So is that what this is? Are we living in a computer game, a, a matrix of sort, a, a projection, whatever? So it's like anything that is a metaphor that we use to understand things and for our human brains to fully understand what's going on. So to a degree, yes except that the experiences that we have when we hear are real. We are really living it. We are really experiencing it. So we're not just holograms that are, you know, experiencing a thing that isn't tangible, that isn't real. And soul energy is far more profound and far more than anything that any computer game could actually create. So the metaphor works. Absolutely. I think we come here for experience. I do see the earth plane as a bit of a school because, you know, I have it on great authority from some of the further explorations that I've done that this is one of the few places where you have this duality, where you have this sort of, you know, opportunity to do such dark stuff and such light stuff. So, you know, there may be other realms or other dimensions that, you know, we can inhabit or incarnate into where it's a lot easier. So, Yes, I think Earth is a school. Yes, the analogy works, but I'm not so keen on the idea that we're just simulations in a computer game. Because also partly that would presuppose that somebody else is controlling us or that somebody else is making the choices and they're not. We have free will when we're here. We have a mission. We don't have to work through it. You know, we can completely change our minds and ignore it. <laughs> we usually get quite distinct prompts and kicks from those that are kind of supporting us from from the other realms so signposts and events will happen that no, try and yeah. steer us back to the path uh you know i don't know if you'd seen um oh my god what is that movie the uh oh what's it called the something bureau the adjustment is it adjustment, adjustment bureau, bureau? Yeah, the adjustment good bureau. Film, yeah. great film except like most things 
instead of using a concept which was brilliant that there were guides and, and you know that, that there are people or beings kind of strategically placed to help push us it was just a little bit of a shame that they turned them into men in black suits who were sort of the baddies which i don't see that at all i think that our guides are around and they can appear in different guises or maybe even work through other people or you know souls that will volunteer to come and help us but i think that they're they're on our side so i i don't think i think i think i'd like to see another version of that movie done but where the guys are actually going quick you know get on the bus the person that's your soulmate is on there quick go and jump into you know a, a bit more supportive i know what you mean um there's two points that i want to get to again it's always two points for me yes um soul contracts we've still got to get into by the way but okay. um the coming here to do stuff right and the, the pendulum yeah. swing to murder to to victim right it's weird that if everything that you say is true and i believe it by the way um i just want to know this for other people listening out there it means that as a soul or whatever we are in up here we are choosing to inflict utter pain and anguish and misery and be an absolute arse I just, why would we choose to make suffering or to suffer? It's weird. I do have an answer for that. Cool, I'm uh, keen to listen <laughs> to it. Because <laughs> I've had this battle, I've had this conversation with my father many times when he said, why would, you know, why would souls choose to, to do that? Why would somebody mm. choose to come in and inflict all of that pain and suffering? Um, I think that our home base, you know, wh wherever that is, you know, in this place of beauty and pure unconditional love and you know our natural resting state is eff effectively it's a state of bliss you know that the name heaven is is no accident you know we go back we're pure energy we have no concerns we have no worries we are just pure beingness and i think we get bored <laughs> and it's as simple as that i think we get bored and i think that we need a challenge and I think that we need to push ourselves and I think that souls are, especially when we're in the spirit realms, we don't really comprehend what that suffering's like because we don't need anything. We don't really experience anything. So I think what's happened in the past is that souls have set challenges for themselves to really push themselves out to the limits. Not recognizing just how difficult it is when you get here onto the earth plane and actually how dense the energy is when you get here and i think part of the problem is that some souls when they get here they get so caught up in the visceral actual beingness the the, the humanness that the essence of the the soul which is compassion and love and beauty and all, all of those things uh, it gets forgotten completely and some people do get a bit carried away and i think some actually start to enjoy that the the, the dark side and then it escalates and then you know it, it it kind of perpetuates and sometimes people do uh get lost in it and i think because they've then accrued the karma that goes with that that other souls then get caught up in that cycle so i think we made a bit of a mess of it really uh, I think it probably escalated a bit further into the suffering side of it than it needed to. But at the same time, and Alan Watts, if you're familiar with Alan Watts, you know, he, he does a, a really wonderful description. I think Inception was based on some of his ideas. You know, he really talks about the fact that, you know, when, when we're coming in and we're making these choices, that the braver the soul is, the harder you want to push and the more you want to see that you can withstand and the more you want to see what you can tolerate and what you can go through before you remember who you are as a soul or can you remember who you are as a soul in the midst of all that so yeah unfortunately i think some souls are quite keen to go to the extreme limits and some souls got a bit distracted and a bit lost yeah it's an odd one um so let's just say we complete a wheel yeah we, we'll call that the hard level we then go back up because we've completed it and then we're up into our whatever we call that yeah ascended i think would okay. probably be the good let's use that term so we're an ascended being at that point 
Okay. Yeah. We must know from that ascended state that we had all that suffering, we had all that joy. So presumably at some stage that one's going to go back and choose a different level and then do another whole wheel. They want to. So that's I a choice at that, at that point, stage. Cho- it would be a choice at that stage. So you yeah. would assume then that, that if that happens again, we're going to wheel number two, yeah. that you would remember suffering and try not to then inflict it because you've already learnt that, presumably, from your first wheel. So yeah, then the second absolutely. round of life should all be lush, shouldn't they, in theory? Well, I think that when a soul has, because, and again, if you think about it, see, and I, I quite often, I think I might upset the Buddhists sometimes because uh, part of my theory is this idea that in order to get off that wheel and in order to achieve ascension, you've got to clear all the karma. You've got to deal with all of the karmic connections that have been generated and you've got to resolve all of that karma before you're free. And that is non-attachment to the, the journey. And where Buddhists talk about non-attachment, I think that it's, again, the message has got a bit skewed because, you know, they're doing non-attachment to people or places or objects or things or, you know, so they're releasing all attachment to all worldly stuff. And I think they're on the wrong path. I don't think that this non-attachment idea, I think the idea is right, but I think you're supposed to get non-attachment from your karmic stuff. And I remember doing a session with somebody who was deeply in a spiritual path and was really working very hard at it. And they went into a lifetime as somebody who had been uh, born into, I I can't remember if it was India, it was somewhere uh, quite remote and got a calling, had a family, but got a calling and the calling was to pray for mankind, to take themselves off. And this person left the family behind and they found a cave and they essentially meditated for humanity, for the rest of their days. You know, lived very frugally, there was a stream, there were berries, you know, there was... Etc. Yeah. You know, so this person <laughs> lived this very basic life and, and then died and then got to the other side and they said, did you do it? And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I was fully committed to, you know, prayer and, you know, totally devoted my, myself to the saving of... of you know humanity and and, you know by being this good person and they said no but did you resolve the stuff with your family your family that you had agreed to go down there to see if you could you know if if you'd be committed to taking care of them and and supporting them and and being a guide for them and it's like oh no not really because I went off and lived in a cave and they were like well you didn't do the non-attachment then because you're still attached to that lesson and now you're going to have to find (laughs) them again and you're going to have to go back. So it's like sometimes the theories aren't, you know, aren't completely right. So once they've cleared all of that karma and now they get to the end of it and it's like, okay, you've finished that cycle. You've finished the round. You've learned everything you needed to. You've done all the pendulum swings. All the boxes have been ticked. As an ascended soul with all that knowledge and wisdom, I believe they then have a choice to not necessarily come back and do another whole round of karmic lives, but then they have a choice whether they want to come in and just be a helper, whether they want to just come in and be a guide. So they could be the person that comes in and is the, you know, benevolent, loving grandfather to somebody that's in a family that's a, excuse my French, shit show, you know, there's (laughs) nobody else to show that person love. And they come in and they play that part. So they're not accruing any karma, that they're just there they might come in to be the one that's going to be the torturer because they want to make sure that that soul fully completes that lesson of torture and they don't ever have to do it again. So they might sign up for the jobs that other people don't want to do, but they have a choice, but they're not actually in that role. They wouldn't accrue any karma for being the torturer because they're above all of that cycle of lives. Yeah, that makes sense. The spiritual teachers and the people that have come in who you know, and again, for, for want of the, you know, diving too much into the realm of religion, but you know, the, the the teachers that have come in with messages, most of them have come in, and the difference between them and the average person is that they know who they are. You know, Christ's message was "I'm God," but his message was also "We're all God." You know, and Akhenaten, who was an Egyptian pharaoh back in the 18th dynasty, said the same thing. You know, the Lord's Prayer is actually based on stuff that Akhenaten was talking about. And Akhenaten believed in one God. 
they call him the heretic, which is the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard in my life, because mm. he was probably the only one in all of those Egyptian dynasties that was telling the truth. And he said, I'm the representative of God on earth, but we're all God. And he believed in peace and beauty and love and celebration and supporting one another. You know, he believed in family and as a tribe looking after each other. But that didn't suit the narrative of the, the, the other priests and the people in power because the problem with life on earth is that's inevitably what it all ends up being about. Who's in control? Who's in power? Who can have more? Who can generate the wealth? Who can control the masses? So I think that there have been many ascended souls that have come into us. We don't always recognise them at the time. And there may be many here still, but not recognised or, or not heard necessarily. I'm going to ask you a strange question now. Um, oh, I love a strange question. <laughs> yeah, it's a quite... A a, f a funny one really uh, do you think then because ascended souls have technically completed the first go and all the karma lessons and blah 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 that people like you doing this work it's a twofold question a you're hacking the right. system a bit really yeah. a bit and two are you the ascended soul because you've come back to help do you think that oh gosh people Absolutely. doing therapy in the wild are and that's not putting an ego into it because no. you are who you are. But yeah, no, I mean, no, I'm I'm very much a human that's on the path. I I still have my work to do, and I'm still working through. I'm pretty sure I'm working through my own karmic stuff, and you know, healing as as I go through. Uh, am I more conscious of it, and am I working towards it? I'd like to think so, but I still, you know, I still on a regular basis am conscious and aware and you know I've, I've healed huge amounts of karma in my family which has totally transformed it uh with you know lots of different friendships and relationships you know i get tested a lot so i've i'd love to, i'd love to say oh yeah you know i'm there but i'm 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 not yet are some of the other healers that are out there possibly maybe i think what i what i am aware of and hopefully this answers the first question um I think that as souls, we realised that we had made a bit of a mess and it has all got a bit complicated down here and it has got a bit messy. And so I think some souls who have worked through a lot and who know a lot and maybe who were the ones that were a bit, you know, crazier and willing to dive in and really do the deep work, which I've definitely done from the hundreds of past lives that I've looked at. Um, it, you know, it definitely, I wasn't going for the faint hearted viewpoint um i think some of us might have signed up to go right you know we, we need to intervene we need to help we need to uh create some shortcuts people aren't getting it you know I, I see time and time again when people get to the end of their life they're not going oh whoopee, well done me i've completed my soul lesson i can tick the you know i can sign that one off now they're usually going oh god you know i, I didn't do it or uh, you know i haven't succeeded and then that misbelief perpetuates it so you know some might say and and uh when i've gone back to memories of earlier times say atlantis or lemuria or really early civilizations souls then had a much clearer idea of who they were and what they were doing and why they were here but okay. it was too easy that's the theory that's the message that i've come up with time and time again and without feeding the information to clients they've all kind of confirmed whenever I've, I've kind of asked that question that there was a certain point where we decided to up the ante to make the stakes a bit higher so at the birth point we had amnesia for everything that we'd agreed to we had complete amnesia that we would forget what we signed up for and so it made it much much harder for us to acknowledge that we'd completed the lessons so I think that most of the therapists that are here now who are doing this work and, and certainly I feel like it's been a, an incredible gift for me is to help people with a shortcut and help them to remember uh, because they're not necessarily going to in their human form. So from my metaphor stage, this computer game, we've turned up the difficulty level. Yeah. And you are fixes or patches to what we would call a patch to a computer game on the way. Yes, I can, I'll take that one. Yeah. yeah, it's not a negative, is it? It's a good no, thing you're up. No, you're upgrading. Absolutely. 
yeah okay so let's um let's hit a few past life um and you don't have to give names and stuff because i know it's like confidentiality and stuff but if you've got any um examples of stuff where you were say wowed by what they had it could be who they were or it could be what they did yeah Obviously, not so, everyone was Cleopatra. We don't want to use that one. No, no. And actually, I mean, a couple of things on that. So firstly, there were actually seven Cleopatras, historically. Uh, there were many. It was quite a common name. And in my experience, my clients tend to go back to lifetimes of quite ordinary people because they're, they're going to heal things. And interestingly, it, it's not always the dramatic lives that come up. It's often lifetimes where there was an emotional shutdown where something happened that really hurt them and they sealed their heart. They're like, I'm not doing that again. I'm not, I'm not risking, you know, it's too painful. Mm. And so loads of souls are walking around with, you know, literally shields blocking their hearts. So they're not opening up to love and compassion. And I think that also makes it easier for people to be, you know, unkind to, to one another because they're not feeling as much as, as they should do. Uh, but one of my, and I've not had, I've only had a couple of people that were kind of relatively famous, but not the ones you'd expect. And actually, when they did go into a lifetime of somebody famous, they were a little bit embarrassed and mortified and didn't want to go there. It wasn't like, oh, look at me, I'm Napoleon. I've not had that. Um, and obviously due to the beauty of the internet, you know, and I've been doing this for what, 23 years now, I think, officially. I've not once had a client whose information didn't match the historical time period. Not once. And I would think by the law of averages, there should be a little bit of it kind of, you know, error in there. So do you um, always check? Yeah. Yeah. I get as Good much information as I can, dates, where they are, uh, what the, you know, what the time period is, um, if I can get names, you know, if they're a farmer living in a, an obscure village in Ohio in the 1800s, the, the names and things aren't quite so important but you know if I had, I had somebody that was a, a writer and so I got the name and I got an idea of what the book she was writing and the, the subjects of the books and she wasn't majorly famous they were children's books but when we googled afterwards this woman existed and she wasn't particularly well known and my client had never heard of her so that was uh, quite reassuring I had another one who this guy had come to see me because, well, in fact, actually, I think it was a the, the session was a present. But when I dug down, because I always do it as a therapy, not just as a, who were you? Yeah, sure. It's too yeah. useful. It's too useful a process. Uh, he was a bit of a work workaholic, and his family were complaining because he was he was a bit obsessed. And he was a medic for a paramedic for an ambulance company. And in the past life. He went back to, it was something like 800 AD, and he was describing his role as a physician, which, you know, and there's quite often parallels. So it's like, okay, he's a paramedic, he's a physician in this lifetime. But he was describing these really complex uh, kind of processes that he was doing. And one of them was he'd actually been, it, it, he'd been working with patients that had brain problems, brain injuries. He was drilling holes in the brain to release the pressure. And he was also obsessed with washing his hands and sterilizing everything. Like he would boil water and wipe everything down. This is like, it was either 800 BC or 800 AD. This is well before, you know, it was middle ages, late middle ages when this idea of, you know, sterilizing things came in. So everybody ridiculed him for this whole idea of keeping things clean. He cleaned all his instruments. So, uh, and nobody else was doing that. You know, they they cut body parts off and then just go to the next person with a dirty knife. <laughs> Horrendous. Yes. Um, and he was also, he was obsessed. This guy dedicated his entire life. Like he never married. He His whole life, he was just completely fixated. And he wrote reams and reams of books and scrolls. And that, that was his whole focus. And he died frustrated that he hadn't done enough. You know, and he'd been obsessed with it, the human body and worked with cadavers and opening bodies up. And, you know, and he'd, he'd done diagrams and, and loads of stuff, which um, for him had never felt like enough. So when I asked the guy what's, you know, I, I'd got the date and I, and it was, I can't remember where he was, but I'd, um, what was doing? 
it was brilliant. I can't remember now where it was, but anyway, he described it. And then I said, "What you know? What's your name? What is it that people call you?" And he said, "Paul." It's and a good name. Looked, right. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's a good name, but not one that you would necessarily associate with, like early kind of you know times. And even he said it questioningly, like Paul oh, it can't be. And he said, "Oh, there's something else." I said, "Well, you know, is there another name? Like, what's the family name?" And he said, "Oh, it's something like Agrippa." or Agamemnon, but it isn't that. But it's something like that. It's A-G, it's something. <laughs> anyway, so obviously we clear, and the, the contract that he had was whether or not he would be prepared to sacrifice his life for the pursuit of knowledge and the greater good, which he'd done with bells on. You know, he ticked the box, so we signed off the contract. There was full agreement because he died feeling like he hadn't done enough. And actually the awareness was that the and it, I, did, I can't remember how they pronounce it, whether it's tree painting or trepanning. Trepanning, but, uh, trepanning yeah. You know, this idea of drilling a hole. Or trepanning, you know, I think it is. Or trepanning, yeah. Trepanning, yeah. Um, you know, he was the instigator of that. You know, some doctor somewhere had found his research and it had inspired that. And then, of course, you look at, oh, and that was plague had hit at some point through his lifetime. And he was one of the few people in his area that survived because his area, his home was sterile. So the rats and the fleas and the whatever hadn't come in. So again, he he died with this awareness. Look, you planted the seeds of all this stuff, and you left all of this information that people did research. So you did enough. You know, you planted the seeds. That's all you could do at that time. They weren't ready for what you were sharing, but you started a ball rolling, and it carried on. And look where the medical world is now. You know, now they're totally aware of all of these things. So there was this huge sense of relief for the, you know, the physician, but he was able to sign it off and say, okay, I devoted my whole life to it. I, I completed all of that. Now I have permission for balance because we we're also, you know, his higher self said that there were other lifetimes where he'd been a lazy wastrel and he'd done absolutely <laughs> nothing at all. So he'd done the balance. So he was given permission to have balance to have family life and have time for him and to have time for the important people in his world, but also still be dedicated and, and focused and to help people heal. So it was huge. Anyway, a few days later, I get an email from him. It's kind of like, oh my God, because he'd gone and done some research and he found Paul of Aegeus, who existed at the exact same time period and was the one that had invented trepanning and had been responsible for the water and all of the things and, and, and leaving reams and reams and reams of, of medical stuff behind him. So yeah, that one was, that was a good one. And they're uh, the ones where you get the shivers. Yeah. Now I need to sort of hearken back to something you said ooh, probably half an hour ago now, but it, it's only <laughs> just, I only just remembered it because my memory's strange. It works like in a defragmented way. Um, you said, when the files thing and you also yes. said that the imagination how do we know that it's the files rather than imagination good question and something that i talk to my clients about all the time because there's a very fine line between memory and imagination so i tell my clients when we start that when the session finishes there are going to be two things that I'll share with them that will indicate to them that this is more than just their imagination. But I won't tell them at the beginning because it may be that they think I've planted a seed or I made it happen. I also ask them when they're going into the process to suspend all need for uh, be believing that this is true because logical mind, the questioning rational mind, is always going to think that they're making it up. It will always question, you know, my mind still does it, you know, obviously I've been doing this stuff for so many times, but my mind still goes, are you sure you're not making this up? Are you sure that you haven't read this in a book or you've seen it in a film? Sure, this isn't just your imagination. So I always ask my clients to just stay curious, just be open. And as long as they go with the first thing that pops into their mind and they're not going off into thinking about it. So I'm very quick with my questions. You know, they just share the first thing that, that arises. And then when the session's finished, inevitably somewhere in the process they will have experienced emotions that are above and beyond anything that is part of your normal everyday thinking there's often a moment of 
realization or there's a loss or they find themselves in a situation where either fear has been generated or they're experiencing suffering and there is this overwhelming kind of whoosh of emotion that comes up and you know they might be tears or they're shivering sometimes they're tangibly feeling the cold or the hunger or the sadness or the whatever the emotions are and even though our imaginations are great and if we're reading a story or watching a film and we identify with the character, we will often have an emotional response. But it's never that instant and it's never that powerful. So for me, that's the first thing that shows that they're tapping into something real that happened because they're reconnected to the emotions that they had at that time. And it's too quick for them to generate it at will. Second thing is that if it was imagination, as they're telling the story, as they're recounting what happened to them, if there's something that isn't very pleasant, their imagination would just change it. You'd just deviate. You'd just move to another place. You know, I had one client who was determined that he was going to go into a lifetime as somebody that was very wealthy, and he didn't. He went into a lifetime of absolute poverty, and he kept trying to change it. He kept saying, no, no, this isn't where I want to be. No, no, this isn't right. This isn't right. And at one point, he actually wanted to come out of the door and go back in through another one. And I said to him, look, I know this isn't what you were hoping for, but this is the one that your higher mind has designated as the one that's the most relevant and the most significant. So with all due respect, I think it would be a really good idea for you to have a look at what this is trying to tell you. You know, let's just be open. I'm sure you have many lifetimes as a, a wealthy person, but maybe you can't get to see those ones until you've cleared whatever this is. And so begrudgingly, in he went. And of course, it turned out this was a massive, massive karmic thing with his mother, his sister, his wife. And, you know, he'd been a man in that lifetime who hadn't been able to protect his family. And they played similar roles, although I think it was his mother was his sister and it was it was, it was kind of slightly the wrong way around. Um, but it was and, and he cried like a baby through the healing part of the session when he realised that he'd been carrying this guilt and he realized that he was, you know, he didn't like to leave them out of his sight. He didn't want them going anywhere. He, he was so controlling with them and he'd never understood what this terror was because they'd all died of starvation and hunger and, you know, and he'd been working like a dog, but terrified of leaving. So it was this huge conflict. So suddenly it was all released, you know, and we healed it. And again, it was a commitment that he had to take care of them. And, uh, yeah, so if it's your imagination, you can change the story, but none of my clients have been able to change it. It is what it is. You know, when they go in, the story will unfold as I'm asking the questions, and there is no way that they can change it. Um, secondary to that is the fact that also it's not what they're expecting, and they're often not glamorous or even dramatic lifetimes. They're often fairly mundane lives that they go into, but there'll be some event or something or some belief that they acquire in that journey that is the thing that's having the, the major impact. So at the end of the sessions, there's also major parallels with their current life and they will have recognition for some of the key souls. You know, they'll see, oh, you know, it's my father was playing my father again. You know, and they're able to do a massive healing on that. And there, there'll often be parallels. It will suddenly it will drop in. It will make complete sense why that person treated them in the way that they did in this lifetime, based on what they'd gone through in that other lifetime. So, yeah, when I, when I say that to my clients afterwards, they are always I've, I've never had a client not actually acknowledge at that point. Yeah. Do you know what? There's no way that was my imagination. And I agree with you and all that makes complete sense. So we've got the evidence of when you've got, like you said, the, the author, you can physically go and check and see the output. Yeah. You've got the emotional torrent, let's say, let's call it that. that yeah. Unless everyone in the world is the bestest actor ever, right. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. And then you've got the synchronicities that play in yeah. those lives. Um, yeah. Here's an interesting one. Um, I've forgotten it. It was a great question. I had it halfway. It'll come back. <laughs> I promise it was a good question. I, I hope it comes back to me because I, I, I liked it. Um, but anyway, well, I've forgotten that. So we're going to move on to okay. um, the soul contracts part of this, which I think sits well yeah. with um, the lives between lives section. Yeah. 
So can you explain what Lives Between Lives is to the best of your knowledge and yep. where soul contracts fit in and what really they are? Yes, I can. So I'm going to put a, uh, a frame around this first, uh, partly because even though I trained with somebody who was trained by Michael Newton, who invented or created the Life Between Lives process, uh, he was the author of Destiny of Souls and Journey of Souls, uh, on his passing, they trademarked the name, so I'm now not allowed to call it Life Between Lives. Okay. What do you call it now? So, between Lives, Spiritual Regression, Journey Between Lives, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems a little strange to me that we're working in a spiritual domain and somebody wants to limit getting this work out to people, but, you know, bless them mm. with love and, you know, whatever. Um, but so... The journey itself, it was discovered when Michael Newton was doing regression work with clients. And sometimes at the end of the session, uh, clients were at the death point when they'd done the healing work, con appeared to continue to, to journey, continue to travel. And of course, there's this idea that is in our consciousness anyway of a place that we go to at the end of a life where we go home and it kind of aligns with the work of dr raymond moody who has been doing all of the uh kind of um, near-death experience work where people have had a, a near-death experience and upon return have described a place that's like heaven They've described having a review of their life. They've described meeting people that they know and, and meeting loved ones. And there was a correlation. The description that Michael Newton's clients were giving matched exactly the research and the work of, of Dr. Raymond Moody. And obviously, I'm a, I, I'd studied all of Raymond Moody's work um, and had the pleasure of meeting him a few years ago. Amazing man. So... Uh, Michael Newton decided to actually do a research study. And I think between him and his students, I think before they put anything out there, now I might be misquoting, but I think they'd done something like 10,000 sessions just to make sure that this was not something that was, you know, coincidental or random. And pretty much the, the clients were coming back with, you know, different versions of the journey because obviously it's going to be different for everybody but the idea being is that when we do uh transcend when our soul leaves the body that there is a place that we go to where we are reunited with our soul family where we get to meet back with our guides where we get to look at the lessons that we've learned sometimes and again not necessarily all of these things are going to happen uh, where we get insights, where we then make the decisions about what we're going to do next. So sometimes there might be different choices of bodies that we can jump into and experience. Sometimes there's profound healing that needs to happen. You know, our soul might be completely battered from the experience that we've had on the earth plane. So we might need an upgrade or a recharge or, you know, a bit of, a bit of rest and recuperation. But the most important part is that we are in that space when we're making the choices to do the next incarnation. We're choosing the soul mission, which is where the contracts come in. And we then need volunteers to help us to fulfill those particular choices and lessons. So a call gets put out and the call will generally go out to the main soul group. But then we have, like any family, you know, they could be there's, there's like the secondary family that could be like the you know the distant cousins and then other soul groups you know if you're working on suffering and you've got a, a group that's working on forgiveness or vice versa and this happened in a session literally a couple of days ago where uh a, a soul that was you know, that that was what they were working on he was working on um suffering and volunteered because he knew that he was really good at doing this and he'd, he'd already done the forgiveness part he'd already experienced the suffering himself so now he was kind of repaying favor if you like to do that for somebody else and because he'd already done the one side of it it meant he wasn't going to accrue any karma because he was balancing his out so he was preventing another soul from accruing karma from causing somebody else suffering 
Gotcha. Which is pretty neat. Very much so. Um, the Soul Group, I've heard yeah. number 12 associated. I don't know why it comes up a lot from other people I've heard. Now, obviously, you've mentioned extended family, brought in and stuff. Where do you think that number sits? Is that right? Is it just a generic? I think that in my experience so far, it's different for everybody. I don't think there is a, a, a general. Um, sometimes if you if you are looking for something specific, uh, you'll find it. So I think if people have that belief, a very firm belief that it's 12, it may be that all the clients they work with, all the research pieces they do, they're going to attract to them all the people that have 12 in their soul group. You know, my my core soul group was seven or eight. And uh, there were, I think, something like 83 in the actual soul group. A but, lot there there. Were, but there were eight of us. There were seven others. And I was the eighth. That was my my core group. And, you know, in this life, they're my parents, my sister, you know, a few key people that have featured in my life. But, yeah, the 83 are all are all kind of major players. And there was another ring of it that was further out. And then there were several other groups that I was working with. And I think one group, it made me chuckle, actually, when I when I had my life between lives. And it made complete sense to me because one of the groups that I'm working with are a complete bunch of hedonists and they love to dance and they love to party and, you know, they, they love to celebrate and travel and, you know, live life. And then the other group were completely and utterly pious, like <laughs> meditation, simplicity, like everything stripped back to the absolute. And I'm like, yeah, there you go. That's my life. It's either one or the other. It's you know, try, trying to find that balance in between. So, yeah, I think that it, we're all different and it's, I, I don't ever like to put a definitive kind of sense on something because experience has just shown me that, yeah, you, you, I don't, just don't think that you can put soul energy into a box because it's infinite. So why would you? Yeah. Why would you? Exactly. Um, I remembered that question, by the way, halfway through that oh, one again, and I wrote it down, which is you said something interesting where a guy went back into his a past life yeah, uh, and he said, oh, that guy's my father here. Yeah. So you in the experience of the regression, they can tell that that person is this and that. And or does that sometimes. always happen or just sometimes? OK, sometimes, sometimes while they're actually in the experience, they go, oh, my God, that's my father. Or, oh, my God, that's my ex-husband in this life. It's more likely that it, we wait till we get to the death point. And then when I, you know, and I'll, I'll always heal any damage that was done to the body as well, which, again, can has had sort of physical changes for a person. Uh, unexplained pains that disappear and, you know, issues that they've had, health issues that the medical world can't fix. I don't ever talk about a cure because we can't and we, we never mm. know, but I have seen, you know, miraculous things happen. But it's more likely at that point because I will call in each person that they interacted with in the past life or other life individually. The, the key figures will bring them in and we'll work through them one by one. And it's at that point, if they haven't gone, oh, my gosh, that's so-and-so, I'll actually say, is there any recognition? You know, they won't look the same, but you might have a sense or a knowing of who they are. And at that point, they might get it. I see. But again, I'm very conscious that they're only going to find that out if it's right for them to know. Because if they're not supposed to know, higher self is going to block it. The powerful main dude at the top. Exactly. <laughs> He's having none of it. Um, yeah. The life review, um, yeah. is that just the benefit of literally replaying the, the game to see where you went wrong, or see where you went right? Is that ultimately what it is? I think so. It's, again, in my experience from my own, I mean, I think I've done three between lives regressions now and obviously work with hundreds of clients. Again, it always plays out differently. Sometimes people don't do that life review at all. They just go straight into a meeting with all of their soulmates and they talk it through. But I went into the first time I went, it was like a, it was like I'd gone into this big white temple. It was quite cliche, really, which I did kind of roll my eyes at and then got 
slapped because my guide said, we're presenting it to you in this way because this is what you were expecting. This is what makes most sense to you. Mm, in a way that you would understand. Yeah. knowledge of the world. And then everything flipped. And they're like, it's just energy. You know, one of the spirits I was, or the, the beings I was speaking to who presented in white robes with a long white beard and the long white hair. And I did kind of go, cliche. <laughs> and then, you know, to my, to my peril, because he then flipped into a dolphin and into a ball of light and then into all these different forms and then settled back and all like in a flash and then settled back as the man on the, you know, on a throne and went, this is what you were expecting. You know, I can be anything. I'm just energy. I'm just doing this for your benefit so that it's easier for you to understand. And I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was like, okay, I get it now. Um, so my life review was in a room that was like a cinema room. And there's a big screen on the wall. And then I'm just showing flashes of things that had gone on. You know, I'm just seeing little viewpoints of stuff that had happened. And when you're watching that, all these snapshots, yeah, do you have the feelings at that point? Uh, or is well, it, are you just watching? You're, yeah, no, you're the observer of it. So you're not actually in it at that point. It's more of the, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. And, oh, no, oh, my God, I'm really sorry that I did that. And, you know, th those feeling bad. And, and what was really interesting in it, as I was suffering watching it, that my guide, who was with me, who was present, pretty much said something like, yeah, but get over it, because these were all things that had to happen. You know, no one's judging you here. So you don't, you shouldn't be judging yourself. Let's wait and see what it meant and what it was for. And, and what the purpose it served before you go into, oh, my God, I'm such a bad person. I'm, I'm so terrible. Look what I did. And then it can be very enlightening when you realize, oh, that had to happen in that way because I was helping that person to learn this lesson, something that we had agreed, or that person was helping me to learn that lesson. And you get to the end of it and you're just faced with a sense of, Deep forgiveness for anybody that has caused you any harm because you've got the understanding now. And again, I think forgiveness is a phrase that's bandied about a lot when people say you have to forgive people. I don't think we can actually really forgive fully until we understand why a thing happened. I, I know agree I, with can't. You. I can't. I can say I forgive you. I can say the words and I can mean it on a certain level. But I think deep down at our core in that subconscious realm, I think there's a part of us that holds on to the hurts because we don't get it. We don't understand. And so the whole ethos of this work is to get to that bit of understanding. Because when I know either you did that because I asked you to do it because I wanted to have that experience or because, you know, we were balancing out some sort of soul karma or, you know, maybe it was a bigger picture. It was something that we were doing. I don't know, for the, for the greater good. When I understand it, now I can forgive you. Now I get it. And then when you get to that point, it's quite extraordinary because you shift all of the negativity to gratitude. Because now I'm just grateful. And my clients often are like laughing at the end of the session. They're like, you literally have just moved me from wanting revenge and wanting to murder somebody because they destroyed my entire family and, you know, they tortured me and garroted me. And, you know, the worst thing in the world. How did I just forgive them and thank them for doing it? And it's like, well, that's the beauty of the work, because now you know why. So for me, gratitude is the kind of magic piece, because it's such a pure energy when we sit in that state of gratitude and just that knowing. And it, it takes us out of judgment. It, it takes us out of questioning. You know, it's like, well, why would we suffer? Why would we do it? Well, because we have to learn the lesson. And that was the argument I had with my father. Why would somebody choose to come into Africa and, you know, and, and be starving and, and, you know, live a terrible life? And I say, but maybe they lived a life where they were in riches and abundance. So they want to know the opposite. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He said, nobody would come in and want to do that suffering. And I'm like, well, you know. Well, maybe. obviously they do <laughs> based on your work. Does this mean then, right, that say uh, knowing what you know yeah. and all the stuff that you've said to me, does it mean that, say you went up the supermarket and someone was an arsehole to you, yeah. you would actually think, I understand why you're doing that? Or do you still have the, mo the emotions of, I'll oh, piss off? <laughs> well, because I'm human, 
p- potentially both. Uh, you know, I am human and sometimes people do piss me off, but it's, I must, I'm much less kind of reactive to it. And there's a flip, a split second kind of awareness of, oh, what's that person going through? Or what is it that caused that person to be that way? And a lot of the time I don't take it personally now because I think, whoa, I'm, you know, whatever their karma is or whatever their their deal is, well done them. They must be really brave. If this person's coming in and, you know, suffering in whichever way they are, because most people that, that lash out are suffering. So I do have a much bigger picture on it. You know, I used to have road rage. I used to be terrible. I used to yell and shout and, you know, I'm, I'm quite a... What did you used to uh, do? Can you give me an example? <laughs> um, I, I'd just be, I would just be yelling and swearing and, you know, just, just getting angry in the car if somebody cut me up or somebody did something stupid, which a lot of people do stupid stuff on the road. And now, having got to that place, it just, and again, this is where I know it's shifted because it just doesn't happen anymore. I, I kind of sit back in a state of people are who they are People are going to get things wrong. People are going to make mistakes. And actually, I shift to a place of kind of, you know, compassion. And, and it sound, this sounds like such cliche. And, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to make myself out to be a saint. But I can hold a state of unconditional love for everybody. Because I love the soul. And I love the essence of who they are. Now, that doesn't mean that I like or tolerate bad behavior. Because if someone's rude to me in the supermarket and it is unjustified, I'm going to speak back to them. If somebody is going to upset a friend of mine, I'm going to be the first person that is going to stand up and say unacceptable, not having it. You know, I'm not going to tolerate nonsense. Hmm. But at the same time, unless I really need to step in, you know, most of the time I just I I just step back and and even in those moments afterwards, I will try and find peace in it and come back to a place of unconditional love. You know, and again, I had a very interesting conversation with my father about that. He's like, you can't possibly unconditionally love everybody. He said, I can. And he's like, what, even Hitler? And I go, yep, (laughs) even Hitler, because I still love the soul and I love the essence of Hitler. And I love the idea of a man who was doing at the beginning what he thought was right for his country. And the fact that, and of course, I've, you know, had lots of experiences, you know, very few souls will have created such an opportunity for other souls to do the suffering in the way that he did and to be tested. And, you know, I've had a few unpleasant lifetimes of my own back in that time period. So you know, I'm speaking from personal experience and again, on both sides. Um, so what an extraordinary soul that he generated all of that capacity for karma to be accrued and then potentially cleared. And I'm really curious about what other lifetimes that soul has lived. You know, who is he in his other guises? That well, he must, have been, he must have had one hell of a lush life then, if he was... Exactly, exactly. That's or what... he was the victim the other side. Oh, no, no, he's created oh, he'll victim, have done both. So yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll, have done, he'll have done it all. But I just think, wow, what kind of level of benevolence is he experiencing in another lifetime to have done the pendulum swing for that one? Mm. Extraordinary. So... Yeah, I don't have to like everybody and I don't have to like behaviours and I don't have to tolerate bad behaviour. And I'm certainly not going to have anybody that would, you know, overstep boundaries or cause harm to anyone around me. But I can still love them unconditionally. And that's a nice sentiment. Hey, your, yeah. your father in these stories is basically the every every man, because he's asking the questions that, let's be fair, the majority of people that might listen to this yeah will ask in their head and they're not wrong those questions are they no and i still ask them myself one of the things that you know the more i learn the more i know i don't know everything and so i know i talk with with kind of conviction about the the things that i believe in but that's because i've had years and years and years and years of experience and i'm not somebody that just believes a theory or who will just believe something because i've read it in a book you know i have to live it breathe it you know it's it it, it, it comes from a place of of absolute kind of testing everything to the limit because i still have the wire brain and i still have the skeptic mind i still question everything myself uh, i don't go into anything blindly so i think those questions are really important 
because if we didn't question and if we didn't tap into our own kind of belief or our own knowing our own knowledge it would be dangerous because we'd potentially believe everything that was presented to us and you know we and can then see... you'd be jumping off a cliff yeah exactly we can see how worlds become very dangerous when you do that so having a, a healthy i'm the greatest skeptic I, I really am you know my friends laugh at me because you know i will i will question everything and i need i need so much evidence for stuff and and actually uh so one of my partners in crime um, Alexandra Wenman, she and I do a lot of work together. And, uh, you know, we were in Egypt a few years ago and I was having, uh, obviously I have a huge history and lots of past life stuff, connections with Egypt. And I go there as often as I can. But this was the first time I'd gone to the actual temples and the Karnak and the Luxors. Karnak, okay. and I was having, yeah, and I was having complete flashbacks. And, you know, I, I walked into one of the temples, I walked into Karnak. And actually, within about 10 minutes of being in there, I literally was so grateful that I had long hair because, and it was dark, because suddenly out of nowhere, I was howling. I was lit, I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And I, I had no, like, no one had said anything to me. I was just walking through, kind of amazed at all of this. And then the next thing, it's like poof, this huge download of, of uh, emotion. And then I started to have flashbacks of, uh, being there and of uh you know intentions and, and kind of missions from other lifetimes which was kind of reawakening like the energies in the temples and it happened in pretty much every temple that i went into and you know i would go in and then i was getting messages i, I you know like a, a channeled message of you know what was uh you know what had happened there and, and effectively like energetic imprints and things that needed healing and releasing um which again will lead on to the spirit attachment stuff um at some point i'm sure and and so you know I, I was doing a lot of healing and a lot of clearing in the in the spaces but i was still doubting myself and thinking oh i'm just making it up you know is there some part of me that wants to be special and wants to be important and because i have this affinity with egypt so I'm, you know, there's a, a very humble, very sort of sceptical questioning part of my mind, always active. And then what started to happen was that at the end of each day, and I wouldn't talk to anybody or tell anybody what I was doing, we would be, you know, either sat by the Nile or, you know, wherever we were having dinner. Alexandra and I quite often ended, we didn't really know each other very well at that point. We quite often ended up sitting next to each other. And at a certain point I said to her, look, I ha I've been having these quite odd experiences and she said oh my god so have I and she said yeah I walked into Karnak she said I felt really emotional just when we got to the the, the point where the kind of the, the huge columns are and I said oh my god that's where I felt it so the skeptic in me said all right but what were you picking up you know what what were you feeling or you know what what sense were you, was, were you getting so she described almost in exactly the same words the message that i'd got which which for me was confirmation which for me was validation and and kind of through that whole trip um and i get it a lot which again they kind of laugh at me because i think my guides know that i need the confirmation so it will often happen i'll get a download i'll get a message about something or I'll do a piece of work and then she'll call me and go, oh, my God, I've just had this, you know, I've just had this channeled message or oh, I had a dream last night that this happened. Or somebody else will call me or I'll pick something up and it'll literally it'll be the same word. So, yeah, being healthily sceptical is really important. But the signs are there. The clues are there if we want them, if if we need that backup. I think our guides, the universe, whatever you want to call it, our higher selves, um, We'll provide it if it's necessary. Great stuff. Now, it's interesting because I spoke to Barbara Lamb a few days mm. ago. Okay? okay. And she said something very similar to you. Okay. In that she had flashes, downloads of Egypt and Peru. Yeah. And it's I interesting. That, Peru. Yeah. It was interesting that a lot of people have that. Now, which leads me on to this question Is there a point on the globe for every single one of us? where we could experience the same thing that you both did in Egypt. So say mine could be, I don't know, London. There could be a, a street where I walk through an almost spatial portal, so to speak, where, oh, there's my download. Yeah. 
Do you yeah, think that's I think the case? So. I think so because what's happening is that you're you're stepping into if you're stepping back onto a, a spot or a place where you've been where you've that you've inhabited in another lifetime remember it and and rem- remember that the the lifetimes are all concurrent they're all happening at the same time so there's going to be a really weird there's a there's a sensation that happens because it's almost like you're walking through your own ghost oh, well, if nice, you're in nice a place phrase. yeah where your your soul is as has been there, is there, it's in a different dimension because it's in a different time frame. But yeah, absolutely. Like I went to Alton Towers years ago, this before I even was doing this work. And no one, I, it's, it was the weirdest thing. We got there and it never occurred to me that there was a tower. I just thought it was a fun fair. It's like, and I'm obsessed with castles and, and towers and castles, always have been. So when we walked in, I'm like, Oh my God, there's a tower. No one told me there was a tower. Can we go to the tower? <laughs> no one told you the sign saying Alton Towers. Yeah. <laughs> and I just assumed it was part of, you know, how Disney World is that I magical castle. I just assumed it was just some part of some uh, event or some ride or something that you went on. And of course, my friends kept putting me off. Oh, we'll go on this ride first and then we'll go there. So it was almost towards the end of the day. And I was demented all day. I'm like, I need to go to the tower. I need to go to the tower. Anyway, just as we were, it's right at the back. So as we were walking along, there was a, a big long wall that I was walking along and the entrance was sort of further up to the right. So I couldn't see anything, really tall wall, couldn't see anything. As I'm walking along, it was the most surreal thing because literally I felt like, like I'd stepped into some sort of portal and I could feel suddenly the weight of a massive big heavy dress with big long skirts that I was pulling. And I had this huge, it felt like this huge pointy hat on my head. That was it weighed a ton. It, it it really was heavy. And suddenly I could hear and smell the sounds of a market and all this hustle and bustle and all these people around me. And it was like I was in this weird bubble. Like on some sense I knew my friends were still kind of with me, but I was in this other realm, these other dimensions, all I can call it. Anyway, it was so surreal because as we were approaching the gate, I knew that I was going to know exactly what that place looked like exactly what it looked like and as we approached i was still having it it was like this overlay it was like a transparent overlay of this other time and then the current time and of course as i walked around the corner it did look exactly and but and it, it opened up into a courtyard which is where i was seeing this market and all these traders and all these livestock and all this stuff and it was medieval it went back to medieval times and then someone said something to me or, you know, someone tapped me on the shoulder and I, you know, and, and it went. And they're like, are you OK? And of course, the, the fine line of what you can tell people, because, you know, back then people still thought that I was just completely weird. You are the so, crazy one, they would have said. <laughs> I, was the, I would be the crazy, you know, I'm talking kind of probably 30 years ago now. And these conversations are a lot easier to have now. But back then... Uh, they were thin on the ground. It it was not, you know, I wasn't living in a world where that was stuff that a lot of people experienced. So I had to be very careful who I talked to about it. But yeah, I think that anyone that goes back to a place where they've had a profound lifetime can have that opening, that awakening. Sometimes it's a person that you meet. You know, everybody, I think whenever I do workshops or talks and I'll say to the audience, you know, put your hand up if there's somebody in your life that when you met them, you felt like you knew them and that you'd always known them. Right, right, you know? No, I don't think there's a person on the planet that hasn't had that feeling. You can't explain it, and you dig deep, and there's nowhere that you've actually, that your paths have crossed in this life, but you know them. It's not always a good knowing. Sometimes you'll meet someone you don't like them, and you don't know why. But other times, it's that deep, deep soul connection that you cannot explain. And for me, the only explanation for that is that you met them in another life. I would say this story about my personal life is that when I met my girlfriend, yeah. I met her picture before I met her. Okay. Because I met her online first. And when I seen the picture, I was like, she's familiar. Right. I'd never seen her before, but there was okay. a knowing of familiarity. Yeah. Which is a weird That's thing. It. You just, it is a knowing of familiarity. And I can't even kind of put it into words, but you know what I mean though, don't you? I know totally what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that- it meant something that meant something that's the unexplainable but it's and I again I always when people say to me and I've had people before that like prove it to me you know prove that what you believe is true and I say firstly 
you know, I spent a lot of my younger years trying to prove things to people. Now I don't need to. Now I know what I know. And it's not my job to try and convince you. Do your own research. Do your yeah. own explanation. Yeah. If you want help and you want me to, you know, share stuff with you or take you through a process, absolutely. But I don't have to prove it. But the one thing that I will say is that there is something that you cannot really describe, but I think you already know it, is when I describe that feeling of knowing. It's like it's a deep inner knowing. You know, sometimes people get goosebumps when when you say something that is categorically true, that your body just reacts to it and all the hairs stand up. But that core knowing is something that has stood me in such amazing stead throughout my lifetime because it doesn't happen very often. But, you know, when it does happen, I there is nowhere else I need to go. And actually, I think we are our own best guidance system. Compass, yeah, we're our own compass, aren't we? Compass, exactly. I think you can even put the word or whatever intuition is into that. Mm. It is that knowing of where to go and what what path to follow, I think. Um, we're going to move slightly beyond the lives between lives into the future lives, and I hope nobody has stolen that phrase <laughs> from you. Uh, well, future life progression is a thing. Um, uh, and Josh. Uh, again, wonderful uh, teacher and uh, uh, practitioner, healer. She has a school doing the future life progression, um, which, and I, I did train with her, but actually having done the training, I've kind of reverted back to working in my own way with it. So I did slightly differently now. But yeah, the future stuff is fascinating because I call it future in focus now. Because we are, and again, this one's a really fine line between imagination and experience, because obviously we're looking at things that haven't happened yet on the linear time frame. For us, yeah. For us. That's not to say that they're not happening in, you know, on the wheel, but in our linear time frame. So it gives people an opportunity to on the one hand, use their imagination to imagine what their life would be like if they made certain choices. But of course, the chances are, and I've seen this time and time again, that, and again, this is where things get quite complicated. Do we live in a universe where there are parallel versions, where each time we get to a major crossroads and make a decision, one part of the soul essence turns left, the other one, turns right you know one takes the red pill one takes the blue pill um and therefore the soul energy has now split into different variations and versions of that all of the outcomes and things that that go with it very very possibly i think that's quite likely uh you know it's like when you have a psychic reading and uh, interestingly Anne is a, a psychic an extraordinary psychic reader uh i always say that and i've done it i trained in um, psychic reading just to see if it's real and it is but when you're tapping into it, you're only tapping into what is your most probable future if you stay on the same path. A good psychic will always tell you that the future is changeable. It's only a, this is your most likely possibility. Your best path mm -hmm. if you make the best choices. Yeah. So when we do the future life process, what I do is I show people what their life will be like. I normally do five years in the future. Sometimes people go to 10, but five is enough for things to have happened, but not so far off that it's impossible. What's going to happen if you don't change anything? That's a really good reality check. Sometimes people go, oh, thank God for that. I'm on the right path. You know, in five years, if I keep doing what I'm doing, it's all brilliant. Other people go, oh, no, <laughs> no way I can carry on. It's just horrendous. Uh, and I guess similar to the way we do it with the past life, where you're opening a doorway and stepping into that new version of a, an experience or a memory, it's the same. I just do it the other way. So I take them on a pathway, we open a door and then they go. Then I get them to see what alternative versions are going to be like. So they may want to have a change of career. Maybe they have a relationship question. Maybe it's a decision about, I don't know a new project or whatever, a new country to live in, whatever they want. So I get them to write a list of all the 
possibilities. And then we literally go in and explore each possible version. And some of them are better than others. And if they find one that they're quite excited about, I go in and I get lots of detail. Uh, I've had clients, and I know Paul McKenna actually wrote quite a few of his very uh, top best-selling books in this method because he went to the future to see which books were going to be the most successful <laughs> and then went back and wrote them. Cheeky swine. <laughs> Absolutely, but why wouldn't you? Yeah, why this wouldn't you? Tool, you, the ability. you know? In fact, and why wouldn't you is my father's favourite saying. Um, you know, I know that Anne's worked with business people and they've gone in and looked at properties and areas. You know, where's going to be the best place to buy? Where's going to be the best uh, place to invest? All kinds of things that you can do. But then what I do at the end is I like to connect people with their higher self, with the intuitive part of self, because higher self doesn't have the same human limitations or fears or doubts or beliefs. Higher self just knows who you are. And then I take them into their highest potential version of the future based on that way of looking at the world and based on that way of looking at themselves, which doesn't necessarily mean that's the one they have to do because sometimes it's above and beyond the effort that they want to put in, but it's a reminder for them of what they could achieve if they set their mind to it. So I'll give you an example. Yes, so I had a client that had a, she had a really good job. And she had just, she was just about to receive a promotion for, she worked for a furniture company that was global. And part of the promotion was becoming head of uh, her region. The next step was head of the UK. And then obviously there was, you know, there were kind of global opportunities. So there, there was a lot at stake. And a friend of hers had actually suggested that they open up a little shop in Brighton that they take turns traveling around the world, sourcing the furniture that they love. And they have a slightly bohemian, slightly quirky, funky shop in Brighton, and they can both take it in turns to travel. Now, okay. clearly, one was going to be much more financially profitable than the other. Uh, so she, she was really kind of confused. So when we looked at the shop in Brighton, it was chilled. It was fun. You know, they got to have adventures. She was traveling. She was coming back. Financially, she was okay. It wasn't, you know, she wasn't doing ridiculously well financially, but she had enough and she was living in a nice flat and she was by the sea. She was happy. She was very, very happy. She was very content. So in the one, does she take the promotion for the London job? Yeah, absolutely. She takes the, the, the London region uh, manager job and in the five years time, she's the head of UK trading and she's living in a huge, great big house. She's very successful. She's driving a top of the range car. You know, she's going to all these big high flying meetings with the company and very satisfied. Then she goes to the highest potential version of the future and she gets to that point and she's the head of global. She's now living in an apartment in Manhattan. She's got this penthouse apartment. Uh, she's got another, she's got apartments in various places around the world. You know, she's traveling, she's holding these huge big meetings and it's very glamorous. She's extraordinarily wealthy and she's really hit the jackpot. You know, she's, she's excelled to the nth degree. But when I asked her, how are you feeling in this space? And she said, well, you know, as amazing as it all is it isn't mine i'm still doing this on behalf of someone else like somebody else's company and so the level of satisfaction you know it's amazing mm -hmm. it's great but the soul isn't in it because i'm still i'm still an employee working for somebody else so when she came back she's like i'm going for the shop in brighton she said, with my, with the awareness of the skills and the knowledge, she said, I know that I'm capable of running the global business. I, my, you know, I've, I've got that capacity to actually achieve that, but I don't need to. Don't need it. Don't need that to fulfill me. So she literally, you know, she messaged me a few days later and said, you know, rang my friend and she said she's already found the property. And she went and had a look at it. And here's the bit where it gets weird because it was the same properties that she saw in her vision. Okay. So she's imagining, or not imagining, envisaging 
and that in is the her reality. imagination yeah. but actually when she gets there it's the same place and i had that i went the one of the first times i did a, a future session i had seen myself and this was when i was just early on doing my hypnosis stuff we did a future pacing thing and i saw myself in a classroom environment wearing a black suit teaching i thought forget it that's clearly my imagination you never wear black come on (laughs) (laughs) yeah but it was just i was wearing a suit and you know very formal and i'm you know i didn't even own a suit at that point and and that would not be my it wouldn't have been my thing at all and i'm like i hated school why would i be back at school why would i be teaching there were these like youngish people that i was teaching Anyway, so I kind of discredited that one completely. I was like, that is definitely not happening. And about six weeks later, I got a phone call from the woman that had been sort of, you know, some of my mentor at the hypnosis college that I was training at. And she said, "Um, would you be interested in coming in and teaching clinical hypnosis to doctors in medical schools? And I said, hell yeah. (laughs) <laughs> because the medical institution, the medical environment, you know, boy, do they need these processes and services because they have no awareness that, that it's not something they're taught. They're not trained in it. They don't. The irony, they don't have a they're not, they're not trained to see the link between the mind and the body, which hurts my head, literally, figuratively. Uh, so for 15 years. I was parading around Oxford, Cambridge, Nottingham, York, Leeds, UCL, Imperial, all the different universities in my suit. And you had that one. You bought that one, did you? That black suit. And I, and I bought the black suit. <laughs> I had to buy several suits, obviously, but I was there. And, of course, there was a day when uh, I am stood at the front of the class and I looked round and it was, whoa, this is that moment. That scene. Is that what deja vu is? I think so. A lot of the time. Yeah. I think it's, we've, we've, because remember time is only linear when we're conscious, when we're awake in our unconscious state, it isn't linear. It's all in there. It's Mm. just that we, we're not having access to it. So, so many times my clients have come back to me and gone oh my god you know that person just turned up or the job just happened or so even though we're using our imagination i say in sort of loose Mm. terms i think we are stepping into possible potential versions of the future and when we make the decision to engage on that path and even though i was still a bit skeptical about the, the the teacher thing you know i'd kind of locked on to it and I guess because I'd committed to the hypnosis, that was the, the the key thing, and then my passion for it, and my you know love for it, and wanting to share it with the world, you know that put me on that pathway, and then that event happened. Yeah, and then it became a reality. Yeah, and it, not just similar, but my clients come back and report that it's identical. It's like it's the flashback of the thing that they saw. So it's a future memory as opposed to imagination. And I like that phrase again, future memory is, a, is an interesting one, but it does sum it up. Now, yeah. you obviously can progress within your lifetime. Can you progress to the next lifetime? Can I progress? Oh, what you mean? Yeah. When I say a future life, an actual future, a future life. life. The poor yes, dies re- tomorrow. Yeah. Next week, I'm Sarah. Yeah, except that's not how it works because it isn't linear because they are not happening concurrent so i don't you so if you die tomorrow your soul goes back to the source there could be a hundred of you still carrying on living so there isn't really a next so this is where it gets a bit confusing because you know when when i was doing the work with Anne, she would get people to go into a life in the future sometimes that would be another option you could go into a future life so I would at the beginning, I was I was quite often doing that with my clients and then they'd go, oh, I'm in 1800s I'm, or I'm in Victorian times. And I'm like, that's not in the future. But their soul, their higher self wasn't translating because they're all they're not linear. They're not thinking so, linear. But you know what my 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 thought is on this, because if we can pass life and go back and find that author and then verify that through means. Yeah. 
can we, from our perspective, even though it isn't from the wheel perspective, go forward to find that life? So yes. we know that that date is 2400, that's an example. Yes. Has that ever been given? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, often, you know, it, and again, it's the, when we go into that realm, the instructions that higher mind takes, it's quite literal about things. So we have to be very careful about how we ask the questions. And sometimes people don't always get the information they want because they are vague in their questions or they can influence it. Like, can we go in and see if this person was Cleopatra? Well, if they are connected on a soul level to Cleopatra, they could potentially open up that file. It doesn't necessarily mean they were her, but they asked the question and the soul, the, the, the guide, the higher self was literal. So if you say you want to go to the future in the earth plane time, so I went into the future, I went to a lifetime, I think it was 3,200 or something like that. So it was in the future, in the earth's history. And yes, so we can go into the sort of the earth's future, the, the linear earth future time. Yes. But we have to be yeah. specific about the question that we ask. So on that basis. Yeah. If we can do that, yeah. could you, during the regression or progression, whatever you want to call that process, can yeah. we ask for what does the Earth look like? Have we gone through a nuclear you know, attack and all that stuff? Is that possible? Yes, we've explored it and, and asked those questions. Uh, in one of the classes that, um, that Anne was doing, she actually or even in some of the research I've done with my own students when I've been teaching, um, you know, we'll ask, the, we'll ask them a specific question and then they go away in their sessions or with their clients and ask the same question. And one of the questions was, what does the earth look like in 100 years from now? And what are you getting back? Uh, I mean, even from my own experience, it all tallied up. It all kind of made sense that there definitely had been a major shift and it looked like it, we weren't necessarily being shown if there was, you know, nuclear explosions or things blowing up. But what seemed to be a very common theme was the collapse of big government and a shift back to more local, uh, local and kind of self-regulating, kind of how things used to be earlier. Um, but that the bubble had burst on the kind of big bigger control. powers that be. Yeah. yeah. And that society had become self-regulating and it, you know, governed from within within groups of people that were working together for the betterment of the, you know. Of their group. local group, yeah. yeah. I've been feeling that very thing myself for a long time. Yeah. That yeah. That's how and, we need to go. But Yeah. Yeah. And I'd seen that when I went into the, I think it was 3,200. It was a long, long time in the future, in the earth plane time. And it was much more simple than it is now although of course you would expect it to be technologically advanced and you know you're expecting spaceships and you know the jetsons you know we're all going around star trek all, i'm after oh star trek yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> although to be fair i think that old roddenberry was uh more of a psychic than he would ever have realized because if you think a lot of the things like the flip phones and you know oh, yeah, yeah. things being transported he was definitely tapping into something that was, uh, you know, from the future. And um, I often think that a lot of the great writers and movie makers, sometimes this stuff is imagination. Sometimes it's not. You know, it's yeah, are the nudges, aren't they? When you're that's a creative, you will spend a lot of time in that subconscious realm, in that right brain arena, when we go into the creativity space and when people drop into the zone or the flow, then that's when you got in, you're getting access to some of that data. And I think some of it probably slips through. So a lot of those people are actually, um, you know, being, being far more literal than, than they realise. But yeah, it was what was so beautiful when i went into that version of the future was it was lots of small communities that were and everybody kind of contributing and you know everybody had their role and their part that they played but i was a interestingly after my the other future thing i was playing the role of a teacher in that environment but what was happening and i loved this 
was that as the children were kind of, you know, getting older and, you know, most of the early life was just all about play and exploration and, you know, being in nature. As they got older, the children were uh, allowed to kind of navigate their way to whatever it was that was their passion. So the children that loved maths or the children that loved art or painting or the children that loved nature, instead of having to sit through an education system that downloaded them or kind of overwhelmed them with everything, they just picked the topic that they loved, which meant that they put all of their time and attention to it, which meant they became an expert at it. If they needed somebody to do maths and it wasn't their thing, they found somebody else that was an expert. And that way, everybody was totally happy in their space and doing their, you know, whatever was their kind of allocated thing to do. And, yeah, it was just fantastic. Free reign to do whatever their passion was. So if your 3200 plan comes, not plan, um, <laughs> vision, future vision comes true, you know that's yeah. kind of almost the utopia that we're after. Yeah, or at absolutely. least we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, now we've hit roughly the two hour mark. Are you okay to give more time or do you need me I to... could keep talking about this subject forever. So, <laughs> okay, well, if you are happy, then I'm happy to go because I've got quite a lot to get through still. Um, okay. I have one another fascinating question here, which is Have you ever heard, and I need to do this verbatim, have you ever heard of a scenario where you do a past life regression and that person goes back to a time? where a person is having a future life session so that that same soul is seeing itself across the timeline, so to speak, like one looking back, one looking forward, and they're both saying, oh my God, look, he's looking forward. He's looking back. Do you think that could happen? No, I haven't, but that is a brilliant question and I need to try that. It would be lush, wouldn't it? Oh my God. Yeah, I've, I'm already thinking who I'm going to practice that with. I've got I've, I've got a few people that I could actually give that a go with. If you yeah. do and you get to some sort of answer, would you kindly email me and I can of keep it private? Of course I will. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Will you will you do me a favor and email me the question exactly yes. as it's worded so that I can make sure that <clears throat> that I I do it properly. Uh there is every chance that, that can happen especially because and this is something that we haven't really covered uh the idea because things aren't linear and because you don't have to die in order to be reincarnated because it isn't just one soul soul energy can split into as many aspects and forms as it needs to because soul energy is ultimately infinite so there can be crossovers so there can be more than one of you living on the earth plane at a time. So I could be 78 different people right now as an example. Yeah. Yeah. So the concept of twin flames or twin souls is based on that premise that soul energy will have split into two different bodies. And, you know, kind of the traditional idea is that they're searching for each other and that when they are reunited, everything is perfect. Mm. Not so much. Um, they don't necessarily come in at the same age. They don't necessarily come in as romantic partners. Sometimes the twin soul is literally the one that comes in to press the button and create the biggest upheaval and suffering and because they want to do the lesson properly. Uh, other times they do come in and suddenly everything fits and it is wonderful, but it's not, it's not a given. But of course, knowing that soul en- energy is infinite, why would the soul, and I know my soul, which is very impatient and wants to get through as much as possible and do as much as it possibly can. The idea that I would limit myself to only two versions of bodies or lifetimes in the one time period when I could throw 15 or or 20 into the mix, all living in different places and having completely different experiences so I could work through the lessons quicker makes complete sense to me. Cool. Now, I'm going to ask you another strange one. All right. I had this thought a few nights ago, um, and when I sort of said it out loud in my mind, well, I might have said it out loud, but it was probably in my mind. Yeah. It sort of did bring up an emotional thing for me, right? Which is, 
what if I make a choice now, then I say in my mind that I don't want to come back here again. Mm. Is that me saying that as Paul? Is that my soul saying it? And if I make that choice, mm. can I overturn the choice from up there that says, no, we're coming back again? OK, so I would suggest, because like I said, I know enough to know that I don't know everything, but I would suggest that that's you as Paul, okay. because the only way you can not come back again is if you have completed all of your karmic lessons. And your soul, your higher self, oversoul, is the only one that knows whether or not that's possible. So I have a lot of clients that say, oh, I need to clear this. I need to fix this because I don't want to come back. And I'm like, well, you're, all of your soul experiences are all happening at the same time. So it's not a matter of dying and then coming back again. There's potentially hundreds of you coexisting at the same time right now. So, and some of them may be in a future Earth time frame. So it's already happening. So the suggestion is always do the work, clear the karma, because that's the only way that you don't have to come back again. And the only way you can do that is by actually going in and exploring and finding out what those lessons or those contracts, what, what those things are, and making sure that they're all resolved. It's a hard question to parse because it sounds almost, when you say it, like a suicide thing, but it isn't that. No. And that's important no, to no, get No, and I get it. It's, yeah, because I think a lot of people that have found being on the earth plane challenging or difficult, they're like, oh, God, I really don't want to do this again. I have moments of it where I'm like, right, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not coming back. And then I go, oh, have I done all the work? Oh, God. You know, and I think um, Richard Bark, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull, uh, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but he, I he don't wrote know like, that one. OK, so Jonathan Livingston Seagull was uh, quite a profound book in the 70s, which was a very conscious seagull that wanted to step out and be different and got persecuted because he believed in more and wanted to just experience flight for the sake of the joy of it and other seagulls flew for purpose and just to eat and to survive so he became an outcast so it's very very metaphorical but he wrote another series of uh, another book called the um illusions the adventures of a reluctant messiah which was a similar thing and this was the idea that what if Christ came back, but he ended up in the Midwest as a, an aeroplane mechanic. How random and could that be? <laughs> how random. And because he, he flies, Richard Bark flies, flies um, small planes. So that's his thing. And uh, yeah, so of course, you know, people start to get wind of this very wise soul that is giving advice and, and healing people. And, you know, and then suddenly they all turn up and say, tell us what to do, Lord. And he says, no, you work it out. I'm not going to tell you. That's not what I'm here for. I'm just here to be, you know, support, send a bit of love. And they're like, no, 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 you, you're the master. You tell us what to do. And he got really fed up with people not taking responsibility and he quit. And they said, you can't quit. You're the Messiah. And he's like, nah, I quit. And he, he buggers off in his aeroplane. <laughs> Him and Richard go off and have adventures. But one of the things he says to Richard when Richard says, have I done the work? Have I done everything that I need to do? And he kind of looks at him straight in the eye and he goes, if you're still here, you haven't. <laughs> you know, you haven't finished. If you're still here, there's still more work to be done. Interesting. Yeah. Well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on from future lives. Although I'll be honest, that's the one I think I could talk about for a lot longer than past lives because past yeah. lives, I think there's an awful lot on it. But future lives, don't you think you could again hack the system? Because if it is true, you could then invest and do all that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that but I'm after you'd personal have trust, gain. You'd have to trust yourself in doing all of that. And that's the problem with most human beings is that they don't trust themselves completely. And I don't know if I would. Um, because also, sometimes our higher self can be a bit of a trickster. Because if you're not meant to be wealthy in this lifetime, if you're supposed to experience poverty and you go into the future to find a way in which you can invest and make loads of money, but it's going to take you off your path, your higher mind might do everything it needs to do to sabotage you. So you go in and, you know, you play roulette and you were going to put it on black 17 and it makes you put it on red 16 and you lose everything. Just to make sure you're still on the path. You to make sure to you're on. still on the path. Bugger! 
Right. <laughs> Let's move on to um, what you call on your website, spirit release therapy. Yeah. Another fascinating topic. Can you tell us, yeah. A, what that is, what it entails, et cetera? So it's based on the premise that sometimes when souls die, they get confused and they don't leave when they're supposed to. Uh, anyone that's ever seen the movie Ghost, who will see the moment when uh, whatever his name is, I can't Patrick remember his name. Swayze. Patrick Swayze in his guise as, you know, he dies, he floats out of his body, a portal of light opens up and these loving beings come in and they're saying, come, come. But he's worried about his girlfriend. And so he ignores the the invitation and he stays. And now he's stuck because the, the, the portal closes. He, as a soul stuck on the earth plane, has no way of opening that portal. He can't do it. He doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't know how. So now he's stuck and he's kind of stuck and, and kind of, you know, attached to the girlfriend. And so at the point of death, if there's confusion or fear or any kind of, you know, mix up, and that soul doesn't leave when they're meant to, because the portal will always open. They're kind of here. So they will attach either to people or they might go back to a place where they felt comfortable or familiar. Or they might attach themselves to an object. They had a favourite vase. They go and hang out with that. Or they're just kind of wandering around. You know, my friend bought a place in uh, Penzance uh, a couple of years ago and uh you know, we were down there and apparently my friend saw a Roman centurion walking through the kitchen and he had been, this was, he, it, this was a route that he had been assigned to. He was, a uh, he was on guard. He, he was watching the camp, got killed and didn't realize that he died. And he was still walking the perimeter of the camp. He was still at it. So the thing with the spirit release work, which is in some ways, some of the most rewarding stuff that I do is that it's about finding these lost souls and essentially reassuring them. Uh, sometimes they die feeling like they're bad and evil and they don't deserve to go home, which is partly why they don't go. Um, reassuring them that they're not, sharing unconditional love with them so that they see that they are worthy of it, and then opening the portal and calling their loved ones in and sending them home. And so sometimes if I'm in a session with somebody, you know, I always work with a pendulum. As I'm putting somebody in hypnosis, I'm actually checking, do they have any attachments? Do they have anyone in their energy field? Sometimes they know, they can feel it. Uh, it's interesting that sometimes spirit attachments will come in and the person may start to develop unusual habits. Like suddenly a vegetarian will have major cravings to eat meat or you know, a, a teetotaler suddenly has a desperation to drink red wine or, you know, mm. smoke cigars or something that's out of character. Or they might feel physically exhausted, fatigued. Um, sometimes it's other sensations. You know, sometimes it can feel like, you know, things are crawling. Like, you know, there's this sort of static in, in your energy field, in, in your head. So sometimes clients will present with a suspicion that something's going on. Sometimes they, you know, even they might hear voices. You know, there's quite a few medical doctors that have had the realisation that some patients that are locked up with uh, suspected schizophrenia, that actually it's not schizophrenia at all, but they have a very active attachment and that's the voices that they can hear. And the attachments are quite often kind of goading them to do stuff or, you know, act in certain ways. And so uh, Isabel, Isabel Frey, I think her name is, was a, a medical doctor. Isabel Ireland Frey, I think her full name is. And she did loads of research where she went in to these uh, medical institutions and worked with clearing spirit attachments from some of these patients and they recovered completely and were able to go home. So... Yeah, it's it's very profound work. Sometimes when I'm working with the clients, um, you know, sometimes it's possible to speak to the spirits. I get them to borrow the client's vocal cords so that I can find out what happened to them and, uh, you know, any fears or concerns they might have, uh, provide the reassurance. 
yeah, like I said, occasionally the ones that think that they're uh, bad, they just need reminding that all souls originated from the same source, from the same place, and that they are pure light energy, you know, pure love energy in their origin. And that's usually enough to um, have them kind of reduced back to some sort of normal form. You know, I've had a few that have been a bit like, ah, you know, trying to be scary. And uh, it's like, yeah, no, I work on the side of the light. So sorry, not doing it. And I'm just going to send you loads of love. And then it's, yeah, you can hear them in there like, <laughs> and then, oh, because you just clear whatever veneer or defense mechanism, which is all it is. They put up a shield of, you know, a, a hard veneer to try and protect themselves. And uh, yeah, then and then we send them home. So whether it's souls attached to land or properties, actually a, an interesting one. I was in Ireland, which is where my family are from, just before lockdown. And there's a beautiful house on the way to the airport that we would pass or in, in the way to Galway. Derelict, it's been derelict for about 50 years. And I said to my dad, what's the story with that house? He went, oh, no one will touch it. It's haunted. It's really badly haunted. They've tried to sell it, you know, no, no, one, no one will touch it. It's really bad. Oh, well, that's not good. Someone's obviously stuck. So the next time we were travelling that way, I said, Dad, can you pull over? He said, oh, God, what are you doing now? Thankfully, my family know that I'm weird and they know what I do. And, you know, they support it all. They're very good. So we pull over and I run to the, the gate. I can't get in because it's all blocked off. And I just tuned in and I just drop into a kind of meditation state open my energy field, tune into the energy of the house and call the spirits to me. And yes, there were a few that had been stuck through whatever reason. And uh, so I open up the portal and I send them home with, you know, with love and guidance. And I see their loved ones come in and it can be quite emotional. And I quite often cry because it's, you know, it's, it's quite lovely when you're reuniting them with the soul family. Anyway, then I close the portal and I sent a bit of healing to the house and off we went. And then lockdown happened. So obviously I couldn't travel. I didn't, didn't get there for a couple of years. And obviously lots of conversations on the phone. But the next time I got over there, dad said to me, oh, by the way, while you're on your way back from the airport, he went, check out the house. I said, why, what's happening? He went, I'm not going to tell you, just check it out. I come past and there's building work going on and they, somebody has bought it and three extensions have gone up. And it's like, Okay, that could be a coincidence. It but you, could. you don't take it as that, though, do you? I don't think it's a coincidence at all. And nobody in my family thinks it's a coincidence. And even some of my dad's friends, because, you know, Irish people are quite open to kind of, you know, spiritual yeah, unusual yeah. things. You know, they're, they're, they're a lot more open, I think, in, in some ways. Uh, they don't really question that there's another another realm. So, yeah, and I, I I seem to spend my whole life, this is one of those kind of silent jobs, really, because wherever I go, if there's a graveyard or if there's a house that I feel a bit of a, you know, bit of a thing, mm. or sometimes things will happen, like my GPS will go crazy, and I'm, you know, on a straight road, and it's like, go left, go left. <laughs> it's a goat track. Go left. Okay. Those and goats I, need help. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I go down the goat track and I'll end up at a derelict house or you know there's a plot of land that I can feel something and uh so yeah it's it, it that is almost like a constant thing that wherever I go and whatever I'm doing if I stay in a hotel or if I stay in a new place the first thing I do I tune in is there anybody here you know is there anyone stuck is there anybody that needs help and yeah so I'm constantly clearing so this means ultimately that then you're a medium so to speak is that right? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the thing. It's like, as a child, I could see spirits. Like, my grandfather came and tucked me into bed when I was about six, which is fine, but he died when my dad was about seven or eight. Now, I didn't know who he was. There was just this really lovely, kind gentleman that came in and tucked me and my cousin into bed, and he, he tucked the blankets in round our neck and then went like this. You know, he had, sort of, he had a hat on and, you know, tweed jacket and whatever, and I just knew I felt this overwhelming love for this man. I had no idea who he was. And it was only 12, 13, 14 years later at a family dinner party. And the topic of 
kind of, you know, people came up. And I th- uh, and sort of around the same time, and I'd ne- it was weird because I'd never seen a picture of him before. It was weird that my nan never really had photos of him out and about. I'd spotted this tiny little picture. I said, Who's that? And they said, it's granddad. And something had sort of jolted in me. And then I thought, oh, wow, how amazing. I had a dream. What a beautiful dream that I had about granddad coming to see me. Because I knew it was the same man. And then at the dinner party, we were talking about ghosts and things. And I said, oh, I had an amazing dream. That, you know, it wasn't necessarily a ghost, but I had this dream about granddad coming to come and tuck me into bed. And my cousin, who is the least spiritual, who's the least open to any of this, she's like as straight as it gets, turned around and said, uh, if that was a dream, then I had the same dream because I remember that memory very distinctly. I remember him coming into the room and I remember him tucking the blankets in around the two of us and telling us to shush. I was like, oh. So I think I've always, you know, and I talk to ghosts and I, I always had that. I don't know. I always had a sense of things and would talk to things. But again, when you're a child, everybody just writes it off to having a very vivid imagination. So I think I'd kind of believe that as well but I was in my teens when I did the mediumship training so I did do it formally so I know it's possible um and I did remote viewing and I did loads of different psychic training so but then I parked all of that because I thought well I don't when I you know I've done read card readings and stuff like that but that didn't really feel like I think I've done that in many other lifetimes so that didn't feel like the route I wanted to go down but of course you know, I look back and they're all pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So it's all, it's all connected. So yeah, when, um, when it became really clear that every time you travel into that subconscious realm, the veils drop and therefore your access to those realms and to those spaces where those souls are and where they're stuck um, is amplified. So it just made sense. Yeah, sure. Have you ever been... Just like, well, you obviously have, because you've just said it, essentially, um, out with people and then just seeing someone who they don't see and yeah, and you can't me, do anything because you're with your family or whatever. Yeah. For me, it's more of a knowing than a seeing. And I hear stuff. My, my friend Alexandra is very visual. Like, she'll see people, but I kind of feel it and I know it more than the vi- if i close my eyes and tune in i'd be able to see it but if i'm just in my normal waking state it's more of a sense um but the beauty of doing this work is that i can do it completely silently without anybody knowing that i'm doing it you know i can just take myself off for five minutes and close my eyes or even sometimes i can do it with my eyes open um i have inbuilt like um idiomotor signaling which is how i can communicate with my higher self so i can use a pendulum to get yes or no answers but actually if i lift if i ask my higher mind if something's true my index finger will lift and the second finger lifts if the answer's no i've so never can... heard of that before <laughs> yeah, well, we, use it in, we use it in hypnosis all the time the idiomotor signal because sometimes in hypnosis i might not verbally speak to a client but i want to get confirmation that something is correct and i'll just ask them to show me and their higher mind will just show. So, yeah, if I, if I need to know if a piece of work has been finished, I get a yes or a no. And the, yep. and the patient or customer won't know that they're going to be doing this? No. So no. it'll just not... randomly happen and they'll not know why? Yeah, they're not doing it consciously because they're, tra- they're in a deep trance state. Half the time they can't even feel their hands. They can't even feel their fingers. But, and it can be very subtle. It can be just a tiny little twitch that happens. But, yeah, I mean, idiomotor signalling, it's a, a key part that we do in in hypnosis but because mine was kind of embedded while i was when i'd done my training i can use that now so if i don't want anybody to know what i'm doing or if i'm working with a client and the client isn't necessarily somebody that i think is going to be you know overly enthused by the idea that they're carrying you know 53 spirit attachments around with them i don't say anything i just wait until they're in the trance state and then i just clear it without telling them so on that basis of when you clear it yeah. How many, uh, presumably, all of your patients will then get back to you at some stage and say, I feel different now because Dave Bob has left for the ether or whatever? If they knew, I don't always tell them. Uh, and so clients will often come back and go, oh, I feel so much better. I feel so much lighter. 
but they don't necessarily know. Uh, of course, other clients do know and they, they do sense it. And some of them will actually specifically come and ask me for that. Um, and yeah, they will always feel different. It's like I went to, um, I did a six week road trip around America to promote my book. Oh, nice. And, uh, and I was doing lots of talks and interviews and sort of little TV shows. And I ended up in Vegas. And I had one day at the end of the trip, it was my last day. And all I wanted to do was just chill out. I didn't want to do anything at all. And I woke up in the morning and the voice in my head said, go to the strip. I really don't want to go to the strip. Like I've been to Vegas lots of times, you know, I love Vegas, but I'm tired. I don't want to do it. There's nothing there that I need to go to, go to the strip. Oh God. And when I get that nudge, it's like, there's no point trying to ignore it because it will just, it will just drive me crazy. So I go to the strip and I'm like, okay, great. I'm on the strip. The strip is really big. Now what am I supposed to do? You know, a little bit more clarity, please. And I get nothing. And then I go and it's hundred degrees. So I go to a cafe and I get a drink and I'm sat outside. I get chatting to a lady who says, you know, are you here on holiday? And obviously it's a bit strange that I'm there on my own. And I, I say, yeah, but I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to go or what I'm supposed to do. And she says, oh, the, um, the, I can't remember what it's called, the Luxor Hotel. She said, oh, I heard some really interesting stories about the Luxor Hotel. And I hadn't told her anything about what I was doing. And obviously I have my fascination with Egypt anyway. So I was like, okay, it's to do with that. And I said, oh, you know, why, what goes on there? She went, well, it's a bit tragic, really. She said, it turns out that it is the highest hotel on the inside because of the nature of the way that it's built and the, the sort of balconies. Standard, yeah. Yeah, I've Standard. been there. It's good. Right, so you know it. Yeah. So inside, from the top balcony, the drop is very severe. It's where most of the suicides go to kill themselves. Lovely. <laughs> And I looked at it and I was like, oh, wow. And I thought, oh, my God. Right. So suicides who are punishing themselves, often, if the portal is opening, they probably don't feel like they deserve to go back. And I thought, oh, now I know why I'm on the strip. So I had to hike up to the Luxor, got in there. I could literally feel them. Oh, there were so many. I mean, there were so many. It was hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds. Anyway, so thankfully, in as you know, in sort of Vegas, anything goes. So I just sat on the floor somewhere and sat cross-legged and <laughs> just pretended I was meditating and uh, opened up a portal and invited them all to go home, told them that there was no judgment and they were all safe and send them all love. And I sent them, I sent them all off on their way. And uh, anyway, off they went. I came home the next day and... I felt like I had the worst jet lag I've ever had. It was awful. And then I thought, well, it's because I've been away for six weeks. It's obviously escalated because of, because of that. But the jet lag didn't go. <laughs> it went on for weeks and weeks. And I was feeling absolutely dreadful. And I went to visit a friend of mine who is, she'd actually been one of my students when I was teaching the regression stuff. And I walked in the door and she went to me, whoa, she said, you look gray. And you look about 100 years older and your energy is like it's just completely wrong. And I said, I know, I'm exhausted. I think there's something wrong with me. And she's like, oh, for God's sake. Anyway, so she marches me into her study and uh, drops me into trance. And it turned out that about 75 of the spirit attachments hadn't gone home. They decided that rather than leave, that they were going to go and have a, an adventure. So they just tagged onto my energy field so that they could live vicariously through me, which meant that they were all draining my energy field. Swines. Yeah, I know, exactly. But then obviously we were then able to send them home. So, yeah, so you have to be, this is not work that is, you know, for the faint hearted. And normally I put up such intense walls of protection that it can't happen, but it's because I was tired and it, you know, and I was I was mm. worn out at the end of a long trip, and my guard was down, foolishly. So you know, I kind of let it happen. But yeah, so people have to be. I would just put a thing out there that people have to be trained properly in doing this stuff. Otherwise, you can end up with you know more than you bargained for. Of course. Now, on that basis, then, do you think that every single person living today has somebody attached in them, and they, they don't know it? No, no. Um, I think that. A lot of the time, what we see particularly is that 
sometimes if somebody has a let's say a weakness in their energy field or what we might call a wo- an inner wound you know there's a, a, a an energy of sadness or an energy of fear or something like that we okay. see it as being like velcro so if there's a spirit floating around and it has that same vibration of fear or that same vibration of sadness or that same sort of glitch you know and there's a weakness in the energy field then they can attach but if someone's energy field is is you know is, is very strong and they don't have any kind of you know strong internal wounding then the spirits just slide off they may hover around but they can't actually attach they can't actually latch on so not everybody's going to have them um sometimes it's a loved one you know it, it, I've, I've often had it where it's a really loving grandparent that wanted to stay behind to look after you know the the, the soul and they don't realize that by doing that that they're actually depleting them or, or causing them harm and as soon as they find out they can't wait to leave and especially when they realize that they can actually do more from the spirit realms to help the person and communicate with them so no not everybody um but possibly more people than realize interesting that one that means there's work out there for someone to go out and just either see it sense it and sort it maybe loads of views are needed yeah now, the ghost scenario or attachments and all this sort of stuff is that just another glitch in this universe that souls have messed things up like you mentioned earlier yeah or not even necessarily mess things up like i said sometimes they've chosen to stay behind because they want to look after somebody that's why you know other than the bit at the end in ghost where you know when the bad guys died little monsters came out to grab them i mean that's just hollywood doing hollywood's thing but that you know it was it was actually really accurate the fact that he had unfinished business you know he really needed to stay behind to make sure that his girlfriend was okay but then when he knew she was okay the portal opened back up again and he could go home you know i think um whatever her name is whoopi goldberg you know playing the fake medium who actually turned out to be a real medium was able to then help him to go back and actually there's a really beautiful film that ricky gervais made called and i think that's actually called i think it's actually called ghosts uh it's a film where he plays a curmudgeonly dentist who has an experience and starts to see ghosts and he doesn't like humans anyway so you know he's now being harassed but they're stuck because they've they've left something unfinished like there was a, a letter that didn't get delivered or you know they wanted to send a message to a loved one or, or keep them safe and the message in that story was I won't ruin it for anybody but you know sometimes these souls can't leave until they've done the thing that they needed to do and sometimes they need help to to do that or they just need somebody to help them open the portal it still makes you think that there's an error in the system though if that is allowed to be that small door with which they can be meant to stay or fall through. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, if it was no, a perfect no system, that, yeah, it would go. it's not a perfect system. No one said the system was perfect. Hmm. <laughs> and here's the problem with the system as well, which is a very important part of it. But the key element of the system here is that we have free will. So we can choose to do whatever we want to do. There is no one, we've, we've get, we get guidance, but no one is dictating what we do or how we do it. And so when we're left to our own devices to do things, of course, you know, it's, it's more human error than system error, I would, I would say. Makes sense. Yeah. And we're not taught any of these things. Nobody teaches us that there is, you know, another realm. You know, I see this with, um, you know, this idea of belief systems, this idea that suicides don't go to heaven, that they get stuck in purgatory. And so often when I'm working with souls in, you know, in a, a death, uh, a death point from an, from an other lifetime or a past life, and they've committed suicide, the soul gets stuck. And they're kind of stuck in this holding place because that's what they believed in their human incarnation, that they didn't have a right to yet go to heaven because they'd done this to themselves. And that's what happened. And so, again, it's about education because, you know, my job as the guide is to take that soul out of the holding place, take them straight back up to the face of the spirit realms, go, look, no judgment. Absolutely no judgment. You were only held there because that's where you believed that you need to be. 
Choice. So, choice. I know. So if we were all taught the right things, but then that's not how the system works. I know, you know and that's what I always um, think. You know, why don't we come? I say come back. You know what I mean when I say that. Yeah. With the knowledge from before, so that we can then make conscious oh, right co- choices. I covered this earlier. You did. I know that, but that you know it was what too I mean. Easy. Yeah, yeah exactly. it, it was too easy, and we needed to we needed to big up the challenge. I think as souls, we got bored, so we wanted to make it more challenging. And I do like that simplicity. Right, let's move yeah. on to another subject: uh, the UFO regression therapy. I oh, presume yeah. you've come across that in your work. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, because it was a topic that I absolutely loved and had a really strong connection to aliens and ETs when I was younger. Um, still not entirely convinced as to whether or not I was actually taken. I may have, you know, but energetically, not my physical form, but, you know, because I have a, a real affinity. Like I said, I have an affinity with Orion for a start, but um, I did have a bit of an obsession with aliens at school um to a degree that it was a bit odd and i did actually convince my friend at school that i was actually an alien alien replica of me that we'd done like a an exchange so that the rain had actually gone to another planet and a bit like a school exchange and i was this alien who was living in lorraine's i was an alien consciousness living in lorraine's body and i kept it up for about two years to the point at which one day my friend got really upset and and kind of cried and said, I want Lorraine back. And and I I remember feeling guilt. And I wasn't sure if the guilt was because I kind of kept this story going or whether it was real. I'm still not sure to this to this day. Um but doing the work, I had thought that I would have much more involvement in doing regressions to see if people had been abducted. Uh, I even met some really amazing people along the way who were very much involved. You know, I've got a very good friend who is part of the big disclosure movement in America, and he'd introduced me to a lot of people. But it doesn't appear that it was, whether it's not yet, but part of the pathway. What's more happened along the way is that when I've done regressions with clients, and in my own experience, that they have gone into lifetimes in other dimensions or lifetimes on other planets or had lifetimes where they they are the aliens and again i've experienced that myself where i've gone to other places and of course you know what the, the beauty of that is the knowing that you know aliens are always seen as something outside of us and something different to us and something other that on that cycle on that wheel of all the lifetimes you know the beings that are in other dimensions it's just another aspect of us they are us there isn't any separation. So there's spokes on that wheel that yeah. if we're taking this further, that's not only within time on our linear timeline. Yeah. It's also in different locations on the earth. But yeah. It could also be in different dimensions and it yeah. could also be on different planets within our 3D realm. Absolutely. So it's not yeah. really a two dimensional wheel. It could be like a three or four dimensional sphere oh, thing twisting around. It's an infinite number of computations. And when you take someone back into a regression, I've heard yeah. a few regression tapes, right? And this is one thing I find extremely weird and how I know you'll be able to give me the answer. How does it work when you ask a question within the hypnosis or regression where you ask the person that you're regressing to ask the alien a yeah. question when in theory, they wouldn't have asked that question at the point in time when they were abducted. Do you Good get what question. I mean? I do totally. And what we have to remember is that when we're doing this work, we are kind of transcending the normal moments in time. So they become snapshots. And because not only soul energy, but time is infinite, space is infinite, that it's almost like you're able to put a pause on the experience that they had in that version of a lifetime and in the pause of that time open up a window of space where they can now communicate with the alien and if what we said a moment ago with the whole weird spooky thing is true and i don't doubt it by the way that alien is yeah. also part of that wheel 
yeah could be the karma of us or not the karma you know what i mean the f- pendulum far swing or whatever so yeah they're also included in that yeah odd so we, when, there may be bits of us right now existing and the, and inevitably there are bits of us existing in all kinds of dimensions on all different planets having all kinds of different experiences now when you've done the work on ufo abductees let's just say you've done 10 right let's throw that out there um what is the commonality brought back to you from those people i if you've ever asked what the agenda is what Mm. has been the overarching theme well well, that's what i said this is the weird thing is that i haven't actually worked with many people who claim to have been abducted okay i haven't uh i don't know why people just haven't really presented uh the closest i got to it and so it's my clients that have actually recalled lifetimes on other planets so that that's that's you know and again it's where my belief in it is so true the closest i came to it was a guy who went into a past life and he was a bus driver and it was this really mundane terribly boring life where every day he got up and he went out and he drove his bus and even he was like god this is rubbish (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, well, we'll stay with it because you're clearly here for a reason. And then he got up one morning, he got on the bus, he drove the bus and an alien craft appeared and he got abducted. So he was being abducted, but in the past life. And again, and I, uh, I'll go out on a limb here and say that it probably applies to all abductions that happen because I can speak from personal experience because I know the same thing happened to me. When I got him to ask, because obviously it was one of the first questions that I got him to ask uh, as to why this had happened, why had he been abducted by this group? And it was because he was part of them and they were taking him home. And it was a moment of reunion and uh, in a lot of times the majority of times it is because they were sent as a kind of scout or as somebody to go and explore somebody to go and have the experience and then they want them to go back and feed back what was happening so that bus driver in essence was a kind of scout emissary learning all about everything and then going back and disseminating that information yeah go down have a, an experience of what it's like to live on the earth plane and tell us yeah I mean, unfortunately, he probably didn't have much to report back because he'd go, well, it's really shit down there. It's really <laughs> yeah, just driving <laughs> crap <laughs> buses. You know, but, but it was about what life was like on the earth plane. And, and I think that I, I would, you know, I, I, I kind of put money on it that 99.9% of the time, that's the general essence of it. You know, that same as a soul comes in and wants to have experience on the earth plane, that we're also wanting to have experiences on all of these other planes. Um, my experience going to other realms uh, and into one of the lifetimes where I was non-human was surprisingly similar to what I remember from being home in my between life experience in that I was in a very long body uh, that was pinky, peachy, color uh i was you know and it was an energy that was it was quite long it was quite lollopy but it was very light so this was an you know i was a different form like my energy it wasn't tangible and solid like my human form so it was very fluid i didn't need to eat i didn't need to it was there was nothing particularly that i needed so there were there was no clothing there was no food there wasn't even particularly shelter i really needed very very little and i was part of a a group of family but my connection with them was even different. Like we were connected, but there weren't the same loving bonds that you would have. So there were there were no real highs of emotion. There were no real lows of emotion. It was very neutral, the whole thing. And it was just kind of sort of, you know, you're just kind of lolloping around in a, well, here we are. This is it. So it was very peaceful. It was very... Um, mm. It was simple, it was peaceful, it was tranquil. But after a while, I remember thinking, God, I mean, this is, you know, it's very safe and it's it's, it's all of those things that, that you would want, but 
oh man, it's a bit boring. <laughs> Almost like there was no point. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, that's not to say that's the same as other experience I've had or other people have reported, but, you know, and I'd had visitations from these beings who had kind of made their presence known and uh, they admitted that they told me that they were the ones that had been responsible for taking me when I was a child, but that it was because they were bringing me back home. don't really know what to say to all that because it's no. just mind bending isn't it yeah Every, it's I like a puzzle on a puzzle yeah it is a puzzle on a puzzle i mean it's such a complex you know if i try and wrap my head around the infinite nature of all of it and the complexity of it our human brains would kind of struggle i mean i guess when we look at computer networks and you look at you know a, the chips with all of the you know interwoven bits even that's not complex enough because it needs to be a 3d model or a 4d model 4D, really yeah. it's if not 5d 60 well, 70 exactly you know? exactly it's it's beyond anything that that we can comprehend you know i've seen glimpses of it and got snatches of it um i think probably i i did a i, I did a weekend of ayahuasca and i think that was possibly the closest that i've got to comprehending it because i was kind of in the midst of it all and seeing the links and the, the the networks to it but did you see the machine elves whatever they call them the the entities within the the trip well no uh i did have quite a, an interesting dialogue with mother aya who uh challenged me on quite a few things um but I did see the um, the construct or the fabric, if you like, of the universe. Everything was reduced down to spinning molecules of energy. And anything that had a human form, the molecules were smaller and faster and uh, more vibrant, more intense. And if it was a wall, it was quite solid. The molecules were bigger and they moved more slowly. But everything was translucent or because nothing was tangible there was nothing solid because it was all just energy that was moving which was on the one hand the most beautiful thing i'd ever seen in my entire life it was exquisite and on the other hand the most terrifying scary thing i've ever experienced because nothing was tangible or solid including myself so there was nothing to hold on to this awareness mm. that everything is just this moving energy no, and that nothing is really solid it's just tightly packed together which is why it has a, a a more physical form that knowledge and that awareness my human brain battled with and i kept on, flipping between the two on that battle mm. here's one thing right your all your research and all your the regressions and blah 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 you've done are leading yeah. to you yeah to this big picture that you've told me across this interview right this is what you believe it is. This is how it's structured. Yeah. Do you think, speaking as Lorraine, that it is a satisfactory conclusion? Or do you think it should be something different? The reality of what it is, i.e. we are all energy doing this school experience. Is that satisfying to you? Or would you rather it be something else? Do you know, I've not really thought about that before, but actually it is satisfying i think it is and if i go to that knowing place about it i don't have any doubt and because i've been shown it in so many different ways in so many different forms and in all the research that i've done there hasn't been anything that has really contradicted those ideas there are obviously other people out there that might describe things differently or perceive things differently and that's not to say that their truth isn't right for them because i mean who knows i mean you know my perception of the universe and, and what happens in it you know maybe that is just my soul's construct and and the way it operates for my soul <laughs> maybe and then we're else. taking it another step now aren't we <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's not to say that somebody else might not have an entirely different version of it and that we're all just grains of sand that are kind of, you know, milling around in this whole great big thing, but that every universe is entirely unique and different. And, and this is the scale of it. This is the, I know enough to know I don't know it all. 
because when I got taken to the sort of edges of the universe by Mother Aya, having passed some very uh, intense tests, she took me out to the edge of the universe where I could see all of this complex nature of how everything was woven together. And she took me out to the edge of it and then went, look again. And when I looked again, I realized that I wasn't at the edge. I was just at the beginning. And it just went on again, like as much as I'd seen already and that there was just more. And it just, yeah, that was the point at which I had to kind of step back because my human brain could have fried completely at that point when you look at the scale and the immenseness of it all. We can't comprehend it. We don't have the capacity within our awareness to actually to do that. But am I satisfied with the piece that I have about what I understand, yeah, actually, I will continue learning and exploring and researching and and looking for more and and looking for more evidence and looking for more answers. I mean, you know, this is a lifelong search. It's never going to stop. You know, this is something that I intend to be doing until my my last breath, really, to to continue. Why? (laughs) Why is this happening? Why are we here? Um, But yeah, there's a, there is a, a part of me that does have peace with what I, where I've come to and what I believe and what you know yeah and what I know yeah I think that's a lush place to end that topic now um I'm going to ask you a question that I ask in every single interview I do Um, okay now this one will be kind of difficult for you because you've given given me a lot of this already Um, because Barrett you won't know but in during some of my interviews I might interview an animator or someone who does something athletic so I always ask what strange things have happened to you right so from your perspective, it doesn't have to be any of the topics we covered. It could be, I don't know, seeing physically a UFO or just a random weird moment in your life or a random weird person you met once. Okay. Can you give me any example of a strange thing that's happened to you? Strange thing. Oh, my goodness. I mean, there are so many. Probably the problem is is sifting through and finding one. Uh, strange, strange, strange. And go. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when um, when I was about eleven, uh, we used to go camping, and uh, we had a camper van. So we would quite often go off grid, and this was when you could do that really easily. And we were down in Cornwall, and we were just kind of driving around. And I and I we were on Bodmin Moor, which I loved the moor, and I loved all the wildness of it. And I had this absolute compulsion i said to my father can you just uh, just keep going and he's like again this was a really old road through you know farmland and i keep going keep going keep going and we ended up at this small lake and when we were we were looking for signposts and it was kind of hidden it was wasn't really well signposted it was called dozemary pool and i we got there and it just felt there was something strange about the place couldn't quite put my finger on it and anyway we had we had our dinner and and whatever you know sat outside looking at the lake and we couldn't quite work out what was wrong with it but I mean it's on you're on Bodmin Moor it's like the wildest you know it's 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 really intense place I'm sure you've been and 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 have you been to Dozemary Pool did you say Dozemary Pool Dozemary Pool. It's oh, an actual cool. lake. Pool. Yeah, not <laughs> no, pool. I haven't. I yeah, have, I, okay. Doesn't ring a bell. All right. So, and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's quite isolated in the middle of the moors. But I, we were looking around. It's like, there's something not right with this picture. We can't work out what it is. And then my dad said to me, there's no wind. Look at the trees. Look at the water. So the surface of the water was like glass and none of the trees were moving. It was really quite surreal. And dad said, I think we should go. And I said, no. No, we mustn't go. We have to stay. Anyway, when like, we had a pop-up roof, my sister and I were in these hammocks. My mum and dad are asleep at, at the bottom and I'm lying there and they all went to sleep. And I, well, and again, like I said, it was about 11 or 12. I was completely wired. Now, obviously, I didn't know what wired was, you know, back then, but I was absolutely buzzing. Like there was some sort of electrical charge running through me and I could hear all of these like whispering voices and spirits, like, like these energy beings. It was like the, they were the, like nature elements or something just talking to me. And it went on all night. And my parents got up in the morning. I was like this. 
but like wide eyed, frazzled, but so exhilarated, so excited. And but they didn't know what was going on. I think they thought I was having some sort of, you know, weird out of body experience or something. Anyway, it was only later when we when we left and I started doing research. Dosemary Pool is actually one of the potential sightings for Excalibur, where Excalibur got thrown. So to this day, and I went back, literally it was about five, ten years, or seven years, about seven years ago maybe, to, I went to try and find it because it stayed with me that that was one of the early experiences of, I wasn't sure what they were saying, but it felt like welcome home and it felt like I had this really deep connection to the land and I felt like I was one of them and it felt like it was this big celebration. It was this glee of returning back to, you know, a rightful place and a place of belonging. And I was just so happy and so elated. And when I tried to find it a few years later, um, got lost about eight times, even though I had it on the GPS. It, I just kept being sent in all random different directions and I wasn't giving up. I was absolutely adamant that I was going to find it and eventually did. And again, it was just, the, the signposts were all marked the wrong way. So it was like somebody was trying to throw you off the scent, finally found it. And I kind of had that same sense of coming home. It wasn't quite as intense this time, but then I didn't stay overnight. Um, but I've never forgotten it. And it, it feels like it's, I don't know, it just feels like there's a part of me that is deeply connected to that. And so I've do got you think that's, so do you think that's one of those portal locations like we said earlier? It's definitely a portal, yeah. And it, it was the first time I really felt such a profound connection to a place. Um, but and I, which I was even though I didn't know how to put it in words really back then, I knew that it was another dimension that I was tapping into, like what I was experiencing and hearing, not seeing so much because I was locked in the um, in the van and there were no windows. You know, I really wanted to be able to see out the window because I was convinced that had I been able to see outside that I would have seen them dancing around and having this celebration. But, you know, I had this plastic camper van <laughs> kind of thing that had gone up. So... But yeah, that's always stayed with me. And it's a memory that when I think about it, just comes back just as vivid now as it did when I was about 11 or 12. So it's an experience that was singularly for you, because obviously yeah. you, your parents couldn't hear it or anything. No. And have you never read or heard anything about that area being that way inclined? Any other stories? I mean... Devon, Cornwall, the history down there and, you know, the Piskies and, the, you know, it's 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 rife with with stories of energies and, and things down there. Um, I'm sure I did research it back then. I can't remember now. But, you know, I just I knew that whatever was going on there, we ta I tapped into another dimension. There were powerful energies there. They were being there were elementals and it was tangible. You know, I could hear them. I could feel them. And I knew it wasn't my imagination. I knew it was real. And it, it, that, that sort of set me up for knowing that we had no clue as to what was really going on. And, mm. and again, it was a real push to to learn more and to discover more. This may sound flippant, but maybe you were the lady of the lake. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Who knows? Yes, I was. <laughs> yeah. If, if, I, if I was, then I'd know where Excalibur was and I'd go back and get it. So, but, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are now entering the Coit Zone. Oh, now, in, okay. you won't know what that is, but in the Coit Zone, I just ask you random, everyday, earthly stuff. So, the first question, do you have a favourite song? All right. I do. It is Elvis's If I Can Dream, because it's an anthem for the world being a better place, and Elvis is my hero. Uh, I love him anyway. And I can never listen to that song without thinking that if only people could stand together and be kind to each other and find that place of love, that the world would be a better place. Do you know what? That's a, a very good sentiment. And again, it just brought up a thought in my mind, which is to say that you are actually listening and digesting the lyrics when most of us just hear a song. Right. Do you know what I mean? So that's probably yeah. something more people should do. Actually yeah. listen, truly listen. Um, Cabris or Galaxy? Uh, I got hypnotised about 10 years ago to not eat milk chocolate, so only dark chocolate for me. Oh, 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 oh. 
<laughs> but what would it have been prior to that experience? Uh, what was the options? Cadbury's or Galaxy? Oh, Galaxy. It would have been Galaxy. Do you know what? A lot of ladies choose Galaxy over Cadbury. Uh, I don't know richer, why. It's a bit creamier. Yeah, maybe it's that. Um, best car you've driven? Oh, my 1966 Austin Healey Sprite, which I still own, but is in the garage and needs some work. A nice project for you. Yeah. Scariest thing you've ever done? Scariest thing I've ever done was the ayahuasca. Definitely. What, the actual, was it the um, preparing yourself to do it or the no, experience? It was that moment when everything split and suddenly there was nothing tangible. That was the most terrible. And I didn't know if it was going to come back and I didn't know if I'd lost my mind or if I could ever find it again. So that was singularly the most terrifying. Also, I don't like heights. So I went to Sri Lanka and I climbed up onto this, I can't remember what it's called. It's like the King's Table or something, this huge big mountain. And there was this ladder that was made out of metal that went up about 500 foot that was just kind of wedged into the side of the mountain. And yeah, and, and we'd already climbed. I don't know how high it was. Um, and I wasn't too bad climbing up it, but it was when we were stood at the top and we had to go back down that ladder. Hmm. And I'd been attacked by monkeys a few days beforehand as well. And there were monkeys running around on the, mon on the mountain surface. And a whole bunch of them came running at me while I was trying to uh, climb down this thing. And oh, yeah, I thought I was going to die. So that was pretty awful as well. But I had to do it because there was a girl on the mountain who was more f afraid than me. And I didn't know how we were going to get her down. So I went first. So even though I was terrified, I just had to, because she needed me, I was able to totally override the fear and just do it. Yeah, sometimes you just have to do things. Um, yeah. Now, uh, da, 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 da. I had a question about that ayahuasca. Ah, yeah, I, do. I remember it now. Um, so that terrifying moment in your ayahuasca trip. Yeah. Have you taken that with you so you have flashbacks of that or did it just stay there? Uh, so I can access all of it, but I have to say that that moment was interspersed and it's completely attached to it being the most blissful, beautiful, most transcending experience I've ever had at the same time. So it's completely neutral. It's completely balanced now. I don't have any element of the fear part of it now because the message was, are you going to do fear or are you going to do love from Mother Aya? And, I, and, and she had me flip between these two states and she made me realise that I had a choice. So by moving my awareness back into pure, unconditional love, I was able to stay out of the fear. So it's a really valuable lesson. But yeah, it's neutral now. Right, you're, we are about to move from the completely profound, which you've done, to the completely banal with this next question. <laughs> okay. Sausages, lightly cooked or crispy? Uh, well, I'm vegetarian, so um, it would be vegetarian sausages and definitely crispy. Definitely. That's a point, a bonus point now. <laughs> um, best thing you've ever seen? Best thing I've ever seen? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, man, I've seen a lot of really amazing things. Um... Is it me? Oh. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, you, obviously. <laughs> uh, oh, so many beautiful things. Um... Just pick a random one. A random one. A yeah, random one of your beautiful things. If you've seen, say, 10, pick one, anyone. Oh, that's really difficult. Um, wow, that's the hardest thing ever. Most beautiful thing. Um, do you need to choose from? Uh, okay, being in Ibiza and dancing to beautiful music and we watched the moon go down and the sun come up. And then if I'm honest, the moon went back down again. Um, and then the sun went down and then the moon came back up and just dancing because dancing is one of my favorite things but just watching nature and watching how it shifts and which actually and if i can jump to another one because that's just reminded me sure. when i was on like a six week road trip and i i drove for 10 hours one day because i kind of got my timings wrong it all looked smaller on the map and i drove i was driving from northern uh california right the way down from Mount Shasta, right the way down through to LA. And so I was driving through the night and it was just plain desert. So I've just got this big windscreen that's just, there's nothing around. 
And as I was driving on my journey, the moon started to rise and it, it rose right across my windscreen as I was driving. So it was moving. But what I was completely aware of, and now I'm thinking of that, the, the, the dancing memory, in that moment, I was totally aware that the moon wasn't moving. It was us. It was the earth that was moving. We were actually rotating backwards, which is why it looked like it was traveling across the sky, but it wasn't, it was us. And I had this absolute awareness that I was this tiny, tiny little vehicle that was driving around on the surface of a globe that was spinning in space. And I'm watching another ball in space in front of me. And that was beautiful and trippy and mad all at the same time. Yeah, I bet not many people get to that state where they actually no. think of it on those levels. Yeah, so, so the cool. moon and the moon and the sun have great beauty for me. And I and think I'll you know, uh, yeah, I think you know why throughout history it's they've both played a massive part for everyone because yeah, probably a shitload of people have had that experience. Um, biggest challenge you've ever faced? No, that that it could be that ladder. For... <laughs> uh biggest challenge wow that's another big question um one of the biggest challenges was being in a marriage with somebody that i believed was my soulmate and um having the realization through my research and the work that i was doing that actually soulmates aren't necessarily somebody that you need to stay with forever once you've learned the lessons and you've done the work that you need to do you can move on and so yeah one of the biggest challenges was actually stepping away and uh having the courage to um put my money where my mouth was and actually live that truth and thankfully it was all beautifully amicable and it was done with grace and ease and and, and love um so, uh, and, and looking back, it was absolutely the right thing. But while I was in it, you know, having been with somebody for 12 years, that was a big ask. It's like, okay, I've just been presented with information. And if I'm going to ask other people to believe and to follow uh, what I'm espousing, then I have to live it. And uh, yeah, so while I was in it, it was very difficult. But yeah, it was a big challenge, but it, it worked out completely as it was meant to. And... The answer you've just given completely reflects all the other answers you've given me during this interview. And most people, I think, if you asked them that question, would give you something physical, wouldn't they? Maybe. I think. I don't know. I, don't know. I like it anyway. Um, how was school for you? Oh, my God. I loved school. I absolutely loved it because I had a brilliant way of absorbing information very quickly, which meant I didn't really have to be present in class. So because I was bored, I would go off and find 53 other things that I could do to raise money for the school or to help somebody do this or do petitions for that. So I was very, um, yeah, and I, I, I was very involved in a lot of different things and liked to challenge people. So I had a great time. I loved it. I kind of liked it. I was also bored by school. Um, and so we need that 3200 time now. So <laughs> we could all do things we like. <laughs> exactly. That's what exactly. we need. The last one in the court zone. What is your go-to drink? It could be anything. Go-to drink? Yeah. Uh, I actually quite like amaretto and soda. Okay. I don't know what or that tea. is. <laughs> or tea. Actually, you know, anybody that knows me would say that I am, um, for me, tea, that would be my alcoholic drink. Interesting that I went there first. Um, probably because it's a Saturday and I'm, you know, getting to that time. Um, <laughs> amaretto is an almond liqueur, by the way. It tastes like marzipan. Right. And if you top it up with soda, it's very refreshing and light and uh, very nice. But no, tea is the answer to all problems. Um, I drink black tea um, or green tea. And no matter where you are or what you're doing, if there's an issue or a problem or you need to celebrate or just for a, no reason at all, tea. Drink tea always. Drink tea always. That's your uh, you know, overarching message. Um, what yeah. else do you like to do in your downtime? Any activities or guilty pleasures? Uh, I love dancing and I grew up doing ball and dancing in the Irish social clubs and I have and I don't have a television so unfortunately I don't get to watch Strictly but if I had a television that's the only problem I'd watch the only program I'd watch um I've taken I've recently taken up ball and dancing again 
that's definitely a, a guilty pleasure. But I also like to paint. So I paint mandalas which are based on the spinning molecules of energy that I saw when I did the ayahuasca. And how are, accurate are you at doing a mandala? Because then is, isn't it like a symmetrical sort of pattern in like a kaleidoscope image? Yes. Well, this is the thing with mandalas and this is the thing with the nature of the universe, which is what a mandalas represent. Because the universe isn't perfect, they don't have to be either. So I sometimes do them very, very uh, kind of you know, strictly with rulers and compass and make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. And other times I do them, a lot of them are freehand. And I think the first time I did one that had a, a kind of almost square lines, patchwork, lots of squares that came together, it was quite Mayan. And I got to a certain corner and thought, oh, the angle's different. And so there was a glitch, there was a, a flaw in it. And I nearly kind of, uh, I hadn't realised I have um, slight Virgo tendencies. Um, the perfectionist in me was horrified and I'd spent days and weeks and months on this thing. So wasn't about to give it up. And the beauty came when I realized that we're not perfect. The universe isn't perfect. We don't have to be perfect. And my mandala didn't need to be perfect. In fact, it was perfect in its imperfection. Yes. And weirdly enough, synchronicity or otherwise, I had this very conversation with two of my friends earlier today. Is that oh, right. Perfection cannot be achieved. No. And you should but never strive for it. Imperfection, everything is perfect. Yes, and that's that's almost the perfect sentiment to finish that section on. Um, so the last question I have for you, which is, uh, what are you currently working on? I.e., what is your future? Ah, so I am currently in the midst of about four or five books that I'm writing. Uh, so Findhorn Press very kindly published my first book, which is all about past life therapy. Uh, but I'm working on a whole bunch of other books. I've written a film script. Nice. I have done an audio book um, with a friend of mine. We wrote a book a few years back, and uh, that's now I, I did the audio recording of it. So we've just put that up online. So I think it's about continuing. It's, everything is in the same theme, um, but it's about getting the message of all of this stuff out to as many people as possible in as many formats. And I realized that writing uh, kind of nonfiction books about this work is only going to reach audiences that are interested in that. So I'm also kind of playing with the idea of embedding it into fiction and getting it out that way because uh, it's much easier to get it into people's awareness and, uh, and quite often using comedy to do that as well. Good on you. I love that. A nice sly way of getting your message out. Um, <laughs> and, and I would say, I think we've come to the end of this interview. I want to say, first off, you know, many thanks for agreeing to it. I think the information you've given is lush. It's opened my mind into lots of different avenues or threads that I want to now go and pull on. Um, and I love that. So one person leading me to the next, to the next, to the next, to try and find my search for the answers. Um, the takeaways I'm going to take away from this is let it go. Mm -hmm. I've always been a big advocate of choice. Um, and I love the fact that you said that the universe and the souls messed up. <laughs> I, think no, that was you. I think actually you said that. <laughs> I with you. you alluded to it. But I'm just basically <laughs> saying it's almost like the last comment we had, which is nothing is perfect. No, perfectly. It brings per it full circle. Perfect in its imperfection. Yeah, I let's like go with say. that. Yeah. All right. So I will say thank you to you for coming on. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. To watch other episodes of Coitcast, or indeed animations I've made, click the image top middle. Click the image top left to download some of my songs, and click the image top right to subscribe to my channel. And make sure you tick that notification bell so you never miss an upload.